Okay, so welcome everyone to the fourth lecture of Dr. Heidi Step One for the Dean of Medical Students. Thank you so much for joining the lecture. Hope you guys are doing well. If you guys can hear my voice, can I get a yes in the chat box, please? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Now, before I begin the lecture for today, and while we wait for some of our other students to come and join, can we do a quick revision and recapitulation of the topics from yesterday? Yes, no? um, uh, another thing over here, I just want to share with you guys a lecture recording of our, of our class from yesterday was uploaded on YouTube. Uh, it was uploaded a little bit later than our usual timing. Let me just show you the link. This is the link for our um, video, which contains information about endocrinology use in step one, everything we talked about um, in the first two, three pages of endocrine pathology and everything is all here. Please access this. Um, and uh, please try to see if there's anything uh, you missed out on if you do not understand anything, please try to let me know. Did you guys get the link for the video? Yes or no? Oh, good. So um, that's basically it. Now, let's do a quick revision and recapitulation of the topics from yesterday. Is everyone ready? Yes or no? Is everyone ready for some questions? Oh. So we started um, endocrine pathology over here. Um, yes, the acid base imbalance uh, chart got deleted. Uh, it did not get deleted. I deleted it from Facebook. The reason being is because um, I do not want to invoke any copyright issues from Amboss. So I'm refraining from. Uh, posting um, emboss charts in the Facebook page because I cannot afford to lose the Facebook page right now. So um, if you guys need the emboss chart, then what I would suggest is um, I can send you the chart via email, but you have nothing to be worried about. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, by today, we will be uploading um, USMLE step two CK endocrinology notes from uh, our notes which we created. Let me just show you an example over here. Um, let me just show you a quick example. Just give me one second. So what we're gonna do is um, we will be uploading USM step two CK notes, which contains a lot of clinical information, including the acid base and balance charts and everything else. But the only issue with the notes is that the notes are handwritten notes. So I'm not really sure if you guys will be able to read the notes. So let me just show you uh, an, an example of my notes over here. So this is the sort of note which I will be uploading today. I'll be taking pictures from my notes, which I created from New World Cards for Step 2 CK. Uh, I just want to ask you guys, can you guys read the notes over here? Is this readable? For example, over here, can you see that I wrote Contrast induced apathy, evaluation of red units. Can you guys read this? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, good. So I'll try to take better pictures under better light quality. But this is the handwriting which you will be seeing basically in my notes over here. Uh, these are basically notes from USMLE Step 2 CK. Um, which I basically created by looking at uh, the U World cards so that my students do not have to worry about making their own notes. All they have to do is um, take the information from over here and use the rest of their time to um, sort of solve U World. So that's it. Okay. So by the end of today, hopefully, you will get uh, all of the notes which are structured like this from endocrinology in the Dr. Hyde page, not the group. 
and you can access everything over there. Uh, with that being said, now can we begin the lecture? Yes or no? Uh, can we do our revision and recapitulation? Okay, good. So you have a patient who comes to you uh, who has a history of um, who has a history of coughing, hemoptysis, weight loss. The patient has a history of smoking one pack of cigarettes for the past 30 years. The age of the patient is 65. It's a male. All of a sudden, the patient the patient um, comes to the ER with fatigue, lethargy, and confusion. What is your provisional diagnosis? So the age of the male is a 65 year old male who comes to the ER with fatigue, lethargy, confusion, mild dementia. And um, the patient has a history of smoking for 30 years. Uh, the patient has weight loss, coughing, hemoptysis. Now, what is your provisional diagnosis? Last chances, please. Yes, but what is the reason for fatigue Lethargy confusion. Very good. The answer is CN or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. Can you can anyone explain why the patient has fatigue, lethargy, and confusion? What is the reason for the fatigue, lethargy, and confusion? Can anyone tell me why this patient has fatigue, lethargy, and confusion? Very good. The patient is hyponatremic. Okay. The patient is hyponatremic because we have um, ectopic secretion of ADH or sometimes in different sorts of carcinoma, especially small cell lung carcinoma. Not only do we have ectopic ADH, we also have secretion of ADH, um, which causes euvolemic hyponatremia resulting in fatigue with the confusion and all of these conditions, okay. Next thing, you have a patient who comes to you, the patient has a history of drinking water excessively, the patient has polyuria, the patient's uh, on water deprivation test, water restriction does not promote or correct the urine and serum osmolarity, but after giving, um, okay, so, oh. Water restriction does not correct the electrolyte and the serum, I mean the serum and the urine osmolarity. What are your two provisional diagnoses for this patient? Water restriction does not correct, does not, it does not correct the urine and uh, serum osmolarity. Your provisional diagnosis is very good, central or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Now, uh, when we administer uh, desmopressin, then the patient's serum and urine osmolarity is corrected. What is your professional diagnosis right now? Very good, central diabetes insipidus. What is the treatment for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? If you, have, if you had to prescribe one drug, which one would you prescribe for this patient? High as high, very good, thank you so much. You have a patient who has come to you with fatigue, lethargy, hyperpigmentation, uh, hypotension, nausea, Confusion with a history of having a normal delivery followed by severe postpartum hemorrhage. What is your diagnosis, your provisional diagnosis? Very good, Shihan syndrome, yes. Okay, yes, very good. This is Sheehan syndrome. Ischemia of the pituitary gland due to excessive blood loss in the postpartum period. This is Sheehan syndrome. We have another patient who has had a history of having bitemporal hemianopia, severe morning headache, vomiting, nausea. Patient all of a sudden complains of the same sign symptoms, that is fatigue, lethargy, confusion, and all of these other things. What is your provisional diagnosis? Very good. You have another patient who comes to you with hyperglycemia, um, hypertension, swelling of the frontal bone or bossing of the, of the, of the frontal bone. There's no swelling, like my apologies, uh, bossing of the frontal bones. And the patient also has doughy structure or doughy nature of the skin. 
what is your diagnosis? Acromegaly, what is your uh, number one drug that you will prescribe for a patient with acromegaly? Oxyotype, very good, okay. Very good. Okay, what else do we have? Um, next one is, if you have a patient who comes to you with um, constipation, dry skin, hoarseness of the voice, swelling uh, uh, around the periorbital area. Along with this, the patient was fine two months ago. Now, all of a sudden, the patient developed these conditions. Uh, it's a 35-year-old female. What is your provisional diagnosis? Please be specific. Please be specific. I, we are, it's hypothyroidism, but what is the common cause of this hypothyroidism? Or even, what is the name of the disease? Hashimoto's. Is everyone clear? What do we find in the histology of Hashimoto's? What do we find in the histology? Very good. Herzl cells. Okay. Thank you so much. You have another patient who comes to you with a history of having uh, an upper respiratory tract illness um, in mid-November. Okay. Now the patient has the same signs and symptoms with a painful swelling. What is your diagnosis? or a painful thyroid, very good, subacute. Uh, how about another patient who has um, the same signs and symptoms with a hard fixed thyroid and it's painless? Redels, fibrosing, thyroiditis. What, uh, can you guys name two other uh, diseases that may be associated with, with uh, riddles, fibrosing, thyroiditis? Riddles, fibrosing, thyroiditis, what are the two other? Very good, non-infectious aortitis and pancreatitis, and another one, another one is retroperitoneal fibrosis, because this is a group of IgG4 systemic related diseases. Yes, okay, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, really proud of you guys over here. Um, Dr. Nazareth, uh, can you hear my voice? Are you the sister of Dr. Jordan, yes or no? Okay, thank you so much for, jo for joining our lecture. Um, your uh, Dr. Jordan is uh, done with step one, yes? Very good, okay. Yeah. okay. So thank you so much. Dr. Nagar is a student of, uh, uh, is a sister of one of our students from the first batch, a very bright student. Thank you so much for joining our lecture. This means well, hopefully you also do really well. In your exam. Okay, if you have any questions, let us know. Now, uh, why, uh, uh, by now, I believe everyone has joined the lectures. Now, let's begin our topic for today. Our topic will start with the discussion of thyroid adenomas, thyroid carcinomas, what, how the questions are structured for each of these questions, and um, how to basically try to understand to always find out the right answers from this. Um, that's that. Is everyone ready, yes or no, for today's lecture? Can we, can we begin? Okay, so let's begin the lecture over here. Okay, now let's talk about uh, thyroid nodules. Okay. Let's talk about thyroid nodules. What are the things that you will do, first and foremost, First and foremost, you might receive a question which can come to you with something like this, that you have a patient who comes to you with an anterior neck swelling, that is a thyroid nodule, right? Um, what are your steps of management? Well, what is the first thing that you will do? Whenever you have a patient who comes to you with a thyroid nodule, right? Whenever you have a patient who comes to you with a thyroid nodule, the first step, can anyone tell me what is the first step that we should do for a patient who comes with a thyroid nodule? The first step is, can anyone tell me over here what is the first step? The first step is basically you have to measure the T3, T4, and TSH. Yes, you have to measure T3, T4, TSH labs. Yes, very good. T3, T4, TSH. Uh, after we measured the T3, T4, TSH, if we find that the patient is more or less in the hyperthyroid state or in the hypothyroid state, then we can conclude if the nodule is um, diffuse, right? For example, let's say that there is no nodular um, sort of feeling 
for example, if the swelling is diffuse and smooth, the patient has uh, signs symptoms of hypo or hyper, then, then we can think about either uh, goiter or we can think about uh, goiter related to iron deficiency. But if we are considering of uh, this nodule being related to a uh, tumor, whether it be benign, whether it be malignant, then what are some of our next steps that we should do? If the T3, T4, TSH comes back as abnormal or we do not, uh, or basically it um, is abnormal and the patient's sign symptoms does not go with hypo or hyper, the next thing that we can do over here is we can do a radioactive iodine uptake, right? To see if the iodine uptake in the thyroid nodule is um, high or low. So basically, if the iodine uptake in the thyroid nodule is very high, we usually try to say that this nodule is a hot nodule. If the thyroid uptake in the nodule is uh, not high, then we call this as a cold nodule. For step two CK, we should also measure a serum thyroglobulin at cold nodule. But for step one, if there is a cold nodule and we want to confirm our diagnosis, whether if it's a benign or a malignant cold nodule, the next thing that we should do is we should do, we should do and fine needle aspiration cytology and we should do a thyroid ultrasonogram. Okay, are we clear? Yes or no? So that's that. Now, another thing that we, sh uh, that we can do is um, straight away we can, uh, in, the, in, the, in the FNSE, when we do the FNSE over there then we can see uh, some things that we can, for example, if when we do the fine needle aspiration cytology of a thyroid nodule, and we see that uh, the patient has, uh, for example, follicular cells, okay, if the patient has follicular cells, the patient does not have weight loss or any other sign symptoms or any history of uh, familial cancers or anything else, then we can, uh, we can assume that the follicular cells are benign and the patient has a benign thyroid adenoma. In that case, we can follow up on the patient, see if the adenoma causes obstructive symptoms or compression symptoms. For example, th thyroid adenomas, if they're big enough, they can cause hoarseness, they can cause um, dysphagia and all of those conditions. And if it's symptomatic, then we can go for surgical resection. If it's not symptomatic, then we can try to see if it, if it calms down. So we have to do periodic surveillance. Another thing that we can find is that we can find malignant cells, right? We can find malignant cells. And another thing is uh, we can find um, your, another thing is we can find the presence or absence of capsules, right? Now, as a rule of thumb, if there's a tumor, if it's a benign tumor, would it be capsulated or not capsulated? That's on this piece. Always remember, benign tumors will always be, will always be capsulated. Yes, there will be no loss of capsulation. Benign tumors will never disrupt your normal architectures, meaning that they will never disrupt your blood vessels. Um, malig uh, malignant tumors, however, will try to invade the blood vessels. Always remember, benign tumors will grow around the blood vessels. For example, let's say these are your blood vessels over here. The benign tumor will try to grow around it. The benign tumor will try to grow around the, the blood vessels. But if it's a malignant tumor, the malignant tumor will try to disrupt the blood vessels over here. Okay, so that's, that. so that's basically what I'm trying to say. Now, having said this, let's talk about the next thing. So the benign cells are basically follicular cells. Now let's talk about some of the malignant cells which we can find over here. Now, the mnemonic, which you can try to remember for this one is um, thyroid carcinomas can be easily remembered by the mnemonic. That is, there are four types of thyroid carcinomas. That is PFAM, so PFAM, P4, Papillary, F for follicular, A for, A for anaplastic, and M for medullary thyroid carcinomas. So we have, so we basically have to differentiate uh, all of these conditions uh, based on what we find in the histology and um, the sign symptoms of the patient. So let's talk about the number one and the most common type of uh, thyroid carcinoma, that is the papillary type of thyroid carcinoma. Um, before we do this, let me just tell you over here, papillary, whenever you see this word papillary, always try to understand that 
Um, this is, a, for example, are we aware that why do we basically get carcinomas? Carcinomas are basically there that whenever we get excessive DNA synthesis or excessive DNA mutation, the cells, they turn from the normal cells to abnormal cells, number one, and then there is excessive growth of that abnormal cell. Isn't that what a carcinoma is, Michelle? Isn't that what anaphasia is? Fast answers, please. Okay, so that's that. Now, uh, papillary over here is very similar to the thyroid type of cell. For example, whenever we say that uh, in a carcinoma, a cell is well differentiated or poorly differentiated, what does this mean? Well differentiate a well differentiation basically means how close how close the malignant cells are to the actual architecture of the normal cells. For example, let's say that the thyroid follicular cells look like this and the papillary cells, they look a bit like this. So if you have to treat the papillary cells, <clears throat> isn't it easier for the cells to sort of revert back to the normal and um, basically uh, have, an, have a better prognosis, yes or no? But what if, the, what if the thyroid cells look like this and the anaplasia looks something like this? Okay, now, which one will be easier to treat and have a better exam and have a better prognosis, A or B? Fast answers, please. The answer is very simple. The answer is A, as simple as that. So this must mean that this must mean that this is very well differentiated, <coughs> and the differentiation of the cells over here are very poor. It's a poor differentiation. Papillary thyroid carcinoma, for that matter, is one of the most uh, the most common. It has the most uh, excellent prognosis. The reason being is because the cells are very, very well differentiated. Uh, the cells are very well differentiated. So how do we basically try to um, see if the cells, uh, how do they basically look like? The cells, they look something like this. I'm talking about the papillary thyroid cells, the papillary thyroid carcinoma cell. What they look like is that they look like a cell which has a cytoplasm, which has an outer shape over here, but uh, the, the cell has a cell membrane, the cell has a cytoplasm, but the thing which the cell will lack is the cell will lack a nuclei. So it looks like a cytoplasm with an empty appearing nuclei. It looks like a like, like the whole cell is the whole cell is consumed by the presence of the of the cytoplasm and the cell membrane. So that's a, that's the first thing you need to remember about a papillary thyroid carcinoma cell. The next thing that we need to remember is that um, these uh, cells they can be easily calcified. They can be easily calcified. Since they're easily calcified, we have a very special name for this sort of calcifications, we call them somoma bodies. So basically we will see calcifications in the form of somoma bodies, okay? And another thing that we can see over here is that uh, these cells, they have groovings. Instead of having nuclei, they, they will have nuclear grooves, okay? Now, how do you remember all of this information very easily? Let me just, let me just tell you over here, Okay, so uh, basically is what you need to remember is that the cell, which does not have the nuclei, right? Which does not have the nuclei, these cells, they are called orphan any cells, okay? Orphan any cells. So the way that I would like to remember this is, uh, can we think about the nuclei as the parents, yes or no, of a cell? The nuclei or the nucleus is basically the mother and the father of a cell. If someone loses their mother and father, right, we call them what? Orphans? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. Yes? Okay. So the fact that this cell does not have a nuclei, right, that's why we call this cell as orphan cell. So orphan any cell. And as a, and as a matter of fact, this is the only reason why the name of the cell came as orphan any because it lacks a nuclei. Another thing is, another thing is what you need to remember for papillary thyroid carcinomas is orphan any 
plus samoma bodies. Samoma bodies. That's all you need to remember at, uh, for the histology of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Are we clear? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. Okay. Okay. So we're still talking about the histology. So that's that. So, so this is the first clinical scenario that you will see over here. Next, you have another patient who comes to you with uh, sign symptoms of thyroid nodule. Then again, you measure T3, T4, TSH. You do radioactive iodine uptake. You find the cold nodule. You do an FNSE. And after you do a fine needle aspiration cytology now, you see another type of uh, cells over here. This cell, this, this cell has the histology of a benign cell. The cells have a histology of the benign cell, meaning that the cells look uh, like thyroid follicular cells. The cells, they look like thyroid follicular cells. The only problem with this one is two things. Number one, it's excessive in number. That is the, the thyroid follicular cells are, are hyperplastic in, in number. And the second thing is it does not have a capsule or the capsule of uh, these, uh, or, or I mean, basically the capsule of the nodule is basically not there, okay? Another thing is there could or could not be vascular invasion. Does anyone have any idea what sort of thyroid carcinoma I'm talking about over here? What sort of a thyroid carcinoma is this? The answer is the diagnosis for this one is follicular carcinoma. Very simple, right? You do not see any sort of um, specialized cell for follicular carcinoma. All you see is a normal amount of thyroid follicular cells, which are excessive in number, which does not have a capsule and which can or cannot have a vascular invasion. The possibility of a follicular thyroid carcinoma to have a vascular invasion is actually very high. The reason why is because they spread via blood. So because the spreading or the seeding of the tumors, they, they take place by blood. A lot of carcinomas, they, they choose the lymph nodes to sort of spread to different parts of the body, except some, and these, and the thyroid follicular carcinoma is actually an exception. That's that. Okay, next one. Next one is once again, you have another patient who comes to you with a thyroid nodule, you measure TTT for TSH, where you have an uptake, you find the uptake is low, it's a cold nodule, you do an FNSC, in, in an FNSC, now you see uh, another type of cell. You see cells that are arranged like this. Okay. You see cells that are arranged in these sort of polygonal sheets, okay? You see cells that are arranged in these sort of, of uh, polygonal sheets. Now, the problem is when you do uh, staining of your slide, it does not stain properly with hematoxylin and leucine stain. So you start using different sorts of stain and you end up using um, the, uh, you end up using the Congo red stain. Please remember this, Congo red stain. So you, you use, uh, we usually use hematoxylin using to stain different sorts of tissues and everything else. But for example, let's say that you, you use hematoxylin and use it and it's not staining properly. So then, so then you try using Congo red. And when, I, and when you use Congo red, you find that, you find that these polygonal sheets, they appear pink, right? They appear, they appear pinkish, which shows that the staining under Congo red shows that the stroma of this whole thing is amyloid. Yes, do you guys know what amyloids are? Amyloids are basically proteins that cannot be broken down by our body. For example, whenever we have a protein in our body or we try to eat proteins, right? We have different sorts of proteases that breaks down the protein, yes? But amyloids are a type of protein which cannot be, be broken down by our body because our uh, entire system does not contain the proteolytic enzymes that are required for the breakdown of amyloid. And amyloids are very visible under Congo red stain. So whenever you use Congo red and something stains like this, you can conclude that there are amyloids. So amyloids in a thyroid nodule will indicate that this patient is suffering from which carcinoma? Can anyone tell me over here which carcinoma I'm talking about? The answer is very good. This is a medullary thyroid carcinoma. 
medullary thyroid carcinoma. And once again, if, if it's a medullary thyroid carcinoma, the carcinoma did not arise from the thyroid follicular cells. The carcinoma arises from the, last chances please, it arises from the parafollicular cells, yes? From the parafollicular cells. Parafollicular cells are responsible for secretion, for the secretion of what? Calcitonin or parathyroid, which one? Last chances please, calcitonin. Calcitonin, do not confuse parafollicular cells with parathyroid cells, parathyroid glands. Parathyroid glands will secrete parathyroid hormone. Parafollicular cells will secrete calcitonin. Okay, now once again, if you find a patient with uh, medullary thyroid carcinomas, what are some of the other things that you immediately need to exclude? You need to exclude what? You need to exclude men too. Very good. You need to exclude men too. So once again, men too, there are two types, 2A and 2B, right? 2A is MPH, medullary thyroid carcinoma, pheochromocytoma, hyperparathyroidism. Men 2B is medullary thyroid carcinoma, uh, mucosal or acoustic neuromas, marfanoid habitus, and uh, P4, pheochromocytoma, right? So you need to see if your patient has pheochromocytoma. You can do urinary or plasma metanephrines. You can do a serum calcium level and or serum parathyroid level to sort of exclude um, hyperparathyroidism. For men to be, you can do, uh, you can check for any sort of mucosal neuromas. You can check if the patient has large limbs and a marfanoid structure, meaning uh, someone who looks a bit like they're suffering from Marfan syndrome, but it's actually how they look like. It's a marfanoid habitus. And you can also check for urinary and plasma metanephrin. So that's it. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Now, next one. If papillary thyroid carcinoma is one of the best carcinomas to have, then obviously there has to be a worst or some of the worst thyroid carcinomas. Yes, it's if there is a best, then there's a worst, right? Because if because when we say that 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 someone or something is the best, obviously they're being compared to something or someone else. So what is the worst thyroid carcinoma to have? Okay, the worst thyroid carcinoma to have is an very good. Okay, it's an anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. This is this is some of the worst carcinomas to have. The prognosis of this carcinoma is very poor. The only reason is because the cells of, of the anaplastic carcinoma are extremely poorly differentiated. Okay, the cells are very poorly differentiated. This is the normal cell. This is the abnormal cell. Next thing is that the growth is very rapid. Okay, the rapid the growth is very rapid. Next thing is there is no distinctive histology of anaplastic carcinoma, except that uh, we will find uh, abnormal nuclear to chromatin ratios, ab abnormal clumps of chromatin, and um, the, all the other different sorts of things. For example, we will not see any capsule. We will see vascular invasion. And another thing that we will see is that the patients will be very old patients. So the patients will be old or they will be aged patients. Another thing that we will see is that they will easily cause compression and obstruction. That is, they will cause hoarseness, dysphagia, and all of those other things. Okay. Are we clear about uh, the four types of thyroid carcinomas? Yes or no? Okay. Yes. Okay. So quick questions, quick answers. You have a patient uh, who comes to you with thyroid nodule. You do a fine needle aspiration cytology and you see cells which are empty appearing that does not have a nuclei. What is your diagnosis? Fast answers, please. Very good. You see... Um, cells which uh, look like the normal cells, but it's high in number. There is no capsular, it, uh, the, the capsules are not intact. There is vascular invasion. What is your diagnosis? Very good, okay. You see another type of cells which does not stain under the normal hematoxylin and you see, so you, you use Congo stain and it appears uh, pinkish or amyloidish in nature. What is your diagnosis? Medullary type carcinoma. Okay, next one is, the next one is, you have another patient who comes to you with dysphagia hoarseness, old patients, all right? There's a huge thyroid, thyroid nodule. The cells are very poorly differentiated. What is your diagnosis? Anaplastic carcinoma. Okay, now, another thing is, let's talk about one more thing before I jump into the, before I jump into the lecture. That is, uh, I mean, before I jump into the text, that is, um, <clears throat> let's talk about the gene mutations the reasons, the most common gene mutations for having uh, thyroid carcinomas. 
Um, so let's talk about the first one. Let's, let's, let's talk about papillary thyroid carcinomas. Why do we get papillary thyroid carcinomas? Papillary thyroid carcinomas are associated with two sorts of genetic mutations, okay? The two sorts of genetic mutations could be, number one is RET mutation. RET mutation is um, uh, uh, actually one of the most common types of mutations that can happen. Basically, there are some common mutations which we will study in the course of our step one. And we will see that time and time again, we have different carcinomas in our body for which RET gene, this gene RET is responsible. For example, are you guys aware that MEN2A and MEN2B happens because there happens to be a mutation of RET? Does, does anyone have an idea about this? Yes or no? MEN2A, MEN2B are also associated are also associated with RET, okay? So either that this could be a RET mutation or the mutation could be due to another group of genes, which we call as BRAF. BRAF. Does it, can anyone name any other sort of carcinomas that are associated with BRAF? BRAF. Okay, it's a, it's a skin carcinoma. It's a, the answer is BRAF mutations are also associated with, okay? It's associated, it's also associated with melanomas. Very good, yes. It's also associated with melanomas, okay? Very good. Okay. Next one is follicular carcinomas. Follicular carcinomas are associated with another sort of uh, genetic mutation. The genetic mutation, we call this as RAS mutation. Do you guys remember insulin uses the RAS MAP kinase pathway to initiate DNA synthesis? Yes, insulin, it uses the RAS MAP kinase pathway. So insulin activates the normal physiology of the RAS MAP kinase. If there's excessive activity of the RAS MAP kinase, then we can get some carcinoma. So, so, okay, so that's basically what it is. Another sort of genetic mutation that's associated with follicular carcinomas, it's not high yield, but I'm just, still, still gonna write it down. It's called PAX8 and PPAR. PPAR stands for peroxisome proliferating activating receptor gamma, PPAR gamma. But if you are asked questions, that the questions will most probably be asked about red, B, RAS, and RAS. They usually do not ask you about this one. Okay, let's talk about anaplastic carcinoma. Anaplastic carcinoma is associated with the absence of one of the most important tumor suppressor genes in our body, that is TP53. Very good. Yes, P53 or TP53. There are different sorts of carcinomas that can arise with the absence of the P53 or TP53 gene. And the anaplastic carcinoma is one of the reasons. We have all of the different sorts of carcinomas that can arise due to this. We can have colonic carcinomas, renal carcinomas, different sarcomas in our body are associated with this. Then we have another um, sort of uh, familial carcinoma syndrome that happens due to the absence of TP53. So we'll talk about all of these uh, later in the future topics. Next one is medullary thyroid carcinoma. Medullary thyroid carcinoma is associated with, as I said, RET mutations. Like, pap like papillary thyroid carcinomas, they're also associated with RET because they are part of multiple endocrine geophasia. So that's it. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so quick questions, quick answers. Um, okay. Papillary thyroid carcinoma is associated with which, with what type of mutation? Fast answers, please. RET, RAS, TP, TP53, PAX8, RET, very good. Follicular carcinomas are associated with what type of mutation? RET, RAS, TPAR. Very good. They're associated with RAS mutation. Anaplastic carcinomas are associated with what sort of mutation? Fast answers, please. Very good. Um, Medullary thyroid carcinomas are associated with what sort of mutations? Oh, good. Now, let's begin our lecture. Okay. Uh, once again, in the lecture, I'll be using red for questions, blue for potential questions, okay? And keep in mind, everything over here is red, meaning that everything over here, which we discussed is a question. And you have to you have to remember all of this information. Okay, so let's start with the text over here. As you can see, we're going to talk. We're, we will start talking about thyroid adenomas. This is the histology of a normal benign thyroid cell. As you can see, that these are nothing but follicular cells. 
right? So B9 solitary growth of the thyroid is known as thyroid adenoma. Most are non-functional, can rarely cause hyperthyroidism by autonomous thyroid hormone production. Most common histology is follicular, okay? That's that absence of vascular, vascular or capsular invasion is um, uh, basically a feature of a benign tumor, unlike follicular carcinoma, where there will be presence of capsular and vascular invasion. Right? Let's move forward to this one, thyroid carcinoma. It's typically diagnosed with fine needle aspiration. It's treated with thyroidectomy. Always remember this, whenever there's a patient of thyroidectomy, there could be chances of data thyroid loss. So patients can suffer from hypocalcemia. Okay, so uh, let's underline some of the complications of thyroidectomy over here very quickly. So we can get hypocalcemia due to the removal of that bad thyroid gland. We can have loss of the recurrent meningeal nerve during ligation of the inferior thyroid artery. For example, are, you, are we aware that right after the patient recovers from a thyroid surgery, the surgeon usually tries to go and speak to the patient to sort of see if the patient has, uh, it has intact voice or not. Have you guys heard of this? Yes or no? Right after thyroid surgery, after the patient wakes up in the post-op, the surgeon goes to speak with the patient to see what is the um, what is the appearance or how does his or her voice sounds like. Because we want to, the surgeon basically wants to make sure that during surgery he or she did not uh, transcend the recurrent laryngeal nerve by mistake. So that's it. And another thing is either the patient's voice can be hoarse. When I always remember this, whenever we have a hoarse voice, either due to uh, damage of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, I mean, whenever we have a hoarse voice, either due to a, a cancer or any other thing, the reason of the hoarseness is recurrent laryngeal nerve. So I want you guys to underline this, that recurrent laryngeal nerve is associated with hoarseness and dysphagia. Okay, this is what I want you to underline over here. And another thing is, if there is a um, loss of um, high pitch or loss of tone, that must mean that there is a damage of the superior laryngeal nerve, superior laryngeal nerve, okay? So the superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve, they sort of uh, stick together with the superior and inferior thyroid artery. So whenever we have to uh, remove a thyroid carcinoma or a thyroid growth, we obviously have to use the hemostat or we have, we have to use clamps or um, different sorts of things to sort of uh, clamp the arteries so that we can remove the gland without having active bleeding. While we do that, there's a possibility we can damage these nerves. So once again, damage of recurrent laryngeal nerve will cause hoarseness, damage of superior laryngeal nerve will cause the loss of professional voice or high pitch. Okay, so that's that. Next one, papillary thyroid carcinoma. It's uh, the most common type of thyroid carcinoma, as you can see over here. Uh, under histology, what do we see? Please underline this and remember that we see MP appearing nuclei. We see some of our bodies, nuclear grooves, not important. Uh, the reason is because we can get increased risk and BRAF mutation, increased risk with RET and BRAF mutation. There's another one which they wrote over here, PTC rearrangement, it's not a high yield. Please try to remember RET and BRAF, that would be enough. Papillary thyroid carcinoma is a, has a good prognosis and everything else. So let's move on to the next one, follicular carcinoma. They also have a very good prognosis. The thing is they will invade the thyroid capsule and vasculature. Uh, it's associated with the vas mutations and pax 8 and PPAR. I'm not going to underline this because it's not high yield. FNSC may not be able to distinguish between follicular adenoma and carcinoma. But once again, if it's a carcinoma, the number of follicular cells will be really high, will be very high. So that's it. Medullary thyroid carcinoma, as you can see, there are sheets of uh, the polygonal cells, as we can see over here, which are visible under Congo red staining. So these are, they form, uh, they are formed from parafollicular cells, which produce calcitonin, which appear as sheets of follicular cells in an MRI stroma, which we have stained with Congo red. It's associated with men 2A and 2B. Okay. Next one, anaplastic carcinomas are one of the worst types of carcinomas for thyroid rapidly enlarging mass, compressive symptoms, they're associated with P53 mutations. Are we clear about this? Yes or no, everyone? Are we clear about this? Yes, did you guys understand? Clear? Okay. If you read it like this, okay, if you read it like this, 
there's a higher possibility that you can retain more information. So if you want, um, if you want to simplify the information, you can have your small little notes over here in uh, this portion of the page. Write down the histologies that you will see, papillary, follicular, anaplastic. Write down the mutations that you will see, uh, you know, red, RAS, whatever, uh, P, 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 P3, and all of these things. So you put that. You can easily read the entire carcinoma in one glance. Okay. So that's it. Now, next one diagnosing thyroid diseases. Okay. Can you specify how to read it, please? Yes. I, um, all you have to do is remember the types of thyroid carcinomas histology of the thyroid carcinomas and the mutations of the thyroid carcinomas. In papillary thyroid carcinomas, what will you see? You will see orphan annies. In follicular thyroid carcinomas, you will see what? You will see normal follicular cells, but high in number. In anaplastic carcinomas, you will see poorly differentiated cells. In middle layer thyroid carcinomas, you will see amyloid stromas, right? And Congo red staining. So you can write, you can have your small note over here, P, F, A, M. And what sort of mutations do we see? In papillary, we see red. In, uh, in in follicular, we see RAS. Then in um, this one is anaplastic. Over here, we see PP two to three, and this one we see red. Okay, so you have most of the information over here. So this is this is easy for you. Don't do it right now during the lecture. Do it later when you are studying the first day by yourself. Um, so that okay. Let's move on to hypoparathyroidism. So basically, what is parathyroid diseases? Parathyroid diseases are um, linked to the level of calcium in your body. Right? So over here, if we have the x-axis and the y-axis, right? over here, we have the parathyroid level. And over here, we have the calcium levels. Right? Now, fast answers, please. Um, if we have... Uh, if I tell you that we have a reading of the parathyroid and calcium level over here at this region, okay, what is the parathyroid hormone level? Is this high or, or is it low? Fast answers, please. Low. What is the level of calcium, high or low? The level of calcium is low. Uh, so low parathyroid and low calcium. What do you think the diagnosis is? What do you think the diagnosis is? Low parathyroid and low levels of calcium. What do you think the diagnosis is? Okay. The diagnosis is very simple. It's, thank you so much, Dr. S. The diagnosis, primary hypoparathyroid. Primary hypoparathyroidism. So let's talk about primary hypoparathyroidism for one minute. Okay, what is primary hypoparathyroidism? Whenever we say primary, that must mean that there's something wrong with the parathyroid gland. Either it's not there, either it's defective, or either there's a chromosomal abnormality for which there is, um, uh, or there is an autoimmune destruction of the parathyroid gland, meaning that the problem is in the gland itself. Either the gland has been destroyed or the gland is not there. So when we say uh, hypoparathyroidism, the number one reason for having this is surgery of thyroid. The second thing is autoimmune destruction. And chromosomal abnormality, we have another one, right? That is um, your, that is your DeGeorge syndrome, okay? D. George syndrome. D. George syndrome is 22Q11 syndrome. Okay. Uh, my apologies, 21Q11 syndrome. So D. George syndrome is something that we will talk about later, uh, but this is basically in D. George syndrome, we do not have the proper um, development of the parathyroid gland. What would happen if you do not have the parathyroid gland? Do we do you have the parathyroid hormone? Yes or no? The answer is no. If you do not have parathyroid hormone, do you have the normal level of serum calcium? Yes or no? The answer is no. If you do not have normal levels of serum, serum calcium, you have hypocalcemia. If you have hypocalcemia, then what are some of your uh, clinical features that you will see in your patient? It's very simple. You will see tingling around the nose and mouth. Okay, this is what first aid is. So tingling around this area of the nose and the mouth, right? 
Then what else? When you, when you tap on the patient's facial muscle like this, when you tap on the muscle, you will see contraction, okay? If for anyone who does not know this, let me just show you the thing over here, what I'm trying to say. This is called Vostic sign, okay? This is called the Vostic sign. Look at this. Okay, so one is the Vostrick sign, as you saw over here, um, that slightly tapping the facial muscle results in contraction. This is a patient with hypercalcemia. Another one is, this is known as the Trousseau sign. Trousseau sign is that whenever we place on the stigma manometer over here, um, there is um, contraction of the carpal muscles, as you can see. Okay, so contractions of the carpal muscles, as you can see over here, look at the hands. And that's so these are the two things that you will see in your patient of hypocalcemia. Now, are we clear about hypoparathyroidism? Yes or no? Hypoparathyroidism. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you guys remember I gave you a small homework from yesterday to learn about the different sorts of second messenger system? Who finished the homework? Yes. Okay. So we have two physicians, Dr. Nazar and Dr. Vike, who wrote yes. How about the rest of the students? Did you guys get a chance to read the second messenger system? Yes or no? Oh, good. If you guys had the chance to read the second messenger system, uh, can anyone please write me in the chat box for showing confidence that they can tell me all the names of the hormones that use CAMP? as their second messenger system. Okay, Dr. Bidula, thank you so much. Please unmute yourself and please tell us the names of the hormones that use uh, CAMP. Yeah, um, the mnemonic is uh, flat champ, chug, uh, FSH, LH, okay. ACTH, uh, TSH, uh, champ, CRH, um, HCG, uh, ADH, which is V2, V2 receptors, and okay. uh, MSH, uh, PTH, CHAMP, and CHAMP okay. for okay. calcitonin. Just me, okay, so just give me one second. So what did you say after MSH? PTH. Oh, bad thyroid. Okay. So are you telling me that bad thyroid hormone they use the CFP system? Yes. Now, let's finish the rest of the hormones. What are the names of the uh, other hormones after PDH? Chug, uh, calcitonin, histamine, glucagon, uh, okay. G GHRH. GHRH, so you said, okay. I think you missed out on one. Did you say prolactin? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, prolactin. Was prolactin in that jam? No. No? Okay, let me make sure. No. I think prolactin was in flat chain. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Oh, my apologies. It's actually calcitonin, not prolactin. Prolactin is, uh, right. I think prolactin it's is tyrosine not kinase. Yeah. It's tyrosine kinase, okay. Uh, uh, did you mention calcitonin? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Calcitonin, histamine, glucagon, and GHRH. Very good. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Okay. So the reason why I asked you uh, guys about this one is because I want to talk about this thing over here. PTH being using the CAMP pathway. Now, we just talked about hypoparathyroidism. What I want to talk about is this condition. Before I do this, thank you, Dr. Middleton, for helping us out with the names of the hormones. Okay, now let's talk about this condition. Um, the reason I want to talk to you guys about this is I want to talk about a condition that is called pseudo hypoparathyroid. Pseudo hypoparathyroid. What do you mean by the word pseudo? Can anyone tell me the name of the word pseudo? What do you mean by pseudo? Pseudo means what? Very good. Fake, false, fake, or false. Okay. So whenever we say pseudo hypoparathyroidism, we are basically saying fake hypoparathyroidism. Why? Do we have fake hypoparathyroidism? What does this mean? This means that 
first and foremost, if it's a fake hypoparathyroid, then that must mean that the patient has clinical features of hypoparathyroid. Yes or no? They have clinical features of hypoparathyroid, but the parathyroid hormone level is actually not low. Yes, it's actually high. Are we clear? Yes or no? Did you guys understand the concept pseudo hypoparathyroidism? This must mean that um, that this is a fake hypoparathyroidism. Fake hypoparathyroidism basically means that there are signs and symptoms of hypoparathyroid, but the parathyroid hormone level is actually not low; it's actually high. So, can anyone come to a conclusion? Why do we have why do we have high parathyroid, but the signs and symptoms are that of a hypoparathyroid? The problem must be where. Fast answers, please. The problem was, must be in the, can anyone tell me the problem must be in, thank you so much. That's what, I was, that's what I was waiting to hear. The problem must be in the receptor. Yes, the problem was me in the receptor. So there's a disease called, there's a disease called <laughs> Albright hereditary osteodystrophy. This disease is uh, basically a, a disease of pseudo hypoparathyroidism. What sort of a disease is Albright hereditary osteodystrophy? It's a autosomal dominant disease, meaning that one of the parents must inherit the dominant gene in order to pass on the gene to the next generation. Okay, so what is the genetic mutation that we get over here? The genetic mutation is in a gene which is known as GNAS gene, right? The GNAS gene is directly associated to what Dr. Mizuno just mentioned over here that parathyroid use a CAMP system, right? So in the CAMP system, we need, um, uh, we need GS, right? We need the GS proteins, right? So over here, the GNAS gene leads to an inactivation of GS and adenylate cycles. As a result, there are thyroid hormone, when it binds to the receptor, and when it binds to the receptor, it cannot initiate the CAMP system. If it cannot initiate the CAMP system, can it activate the 1-alpha hydroxylase and osteoblast and everything else, a normal mechanism of parathyroid hormone? The answer is no. As a result, what do we see? We see, we see what? As a result, we see <laughs> hypocalcemia, hypocalcemia, and we see what? We see high parathyroid. Are we clear? Yes or no? Hypocalcemia of the parathyroid is high. Okay, because that low amount of calcium is obviously stimulating the release of parathyroid. So the synthesis of parathyroid is normal. So it will be released normally. But since it cannot act on the receptor, the amount of parathyroid hormone in the level will be very high because of loss of negative feedback. Are we clear? Yes or no? Okay. Oh, that's it. So if the parathyroid hormone is also high and it cannot work on the parathyroid receptors, can it also get rid of the uh, phosphates in the body? Yes or no? Can it get rid of phosphates in the body? The answer is no. It cannot get rid of phosphates in the body. So the phosphate level is also very, will remain high. Okay. Did you guys understand pseudo hypoparathyroidism? Yes or no? Do you guys understand this concept? Okay. Okay. Now, how there there is another type. There's there's this, another small thing that I want to talk about regarding Albright hereditary osteodystrophy. Uh, Albright hereditary osteodystrophy is not only a problem with parathyroid. Let me just say this: parathyroid resistance. Okay meaning parathyroid cannot work. Mm -hmm. The patients, they also have a very distinctive feature. The distinctive feature of the patient is that, uh, is that their fingers will appear like this. That is the two fingers over here, right? The little, pinty, the little pinky finger and the ring finger, meaning the fourth and the fifth digit. The fourth and the fifth digit will appear short. This is very distinctive of albright, hereditary, osteodystrophy. Along with this, they can have um, subcutaneous calcification that is not high yield 
But if you have to remember something, please try to remember that an albright theta T osteo dystrophy, beta thyroid hormone is uh, high. That's why the calcium level is low. <coughs> Excuse me, because beta thyroid can't work properly. And beta thyroid will remain high, and phosphate will remain high. Okay. Can anyone explain albright theta T osteo dystrophy to me? If I know. Before I move forward, please write me in the chat box if you understood what our, what Albert Hayes the Austrian dystrophy is. Anyone? Can anyone explain Albert Hayes to your Austrian dystrophy, please? Okay. okay. Let me choose someone to help me out. Let's see who's here. Okay. Can we get? Can we get? Can we get Dr. Nazara to help us out, please? With Albright AG osteodystrophy. You do not have to unmute yourself. You can use the chat box. Okay, yes. What is Albright AG osteodystrophy? That's the question. What is Albright AG osteodystrophy? Best answers, please. Let me ask this question to, have to, to everyone. First and foremost, uh, what is albright hereditary osteodystrophy? Is it parathyroid absence of, or parathyroid resistance? Fast answers, please. Parathyroid absence or parathyroid resistance? Parathyroid resistance. Is this autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive? The answer is this is autosomal dominant. Okay. Next one. Uh, there's a mutation in the name of the gene is, the name of the gene is GNAS. Yes or no? The name of the gene is GNAS. Okay. What would happen to the parathyroid hormone level? Will it be high or will it be low? The answer is it will be high. What would happen to the calcium and the phosphate level? Calcium will be high or low? Calcium will be low, phosphate will be high. Okay, now let's talk about another condition where things will get a little bit confusing, but please bear with me. Okay, um, let's say we have, we just talked about fake, Hypoparathyroid. Yes or no? We just talked about fake hypoparathyroid. Yes or no? Fast answer, please. Yes. Okay. What is fake fake hypoparathyroid? Can anyone explain what this means? What do, what do we mean by fake fake hypoparathyroid? First, first and foremost, fake hypoparathyroid means Albright hereditary osteodystrophy. Yes or no? Okay. But what is fake Albright hereditary osteodystrophy? Fake Albright hereditary osteodystrophy basically means that the patient actually does not even have hypoparathyroidism. Right? The patient does not have that. It's almost saying, for example, fake means what? Is fake a positive or a negative word? Fake is a negative word, right? Fake is a negative word. So what is negative hypoparathyroid? Negative hypoparathyroid is albright AD3 osteodystrophy. What is negative negative hypoparathyroid? Okay, negative negative hypoparathyroid basically means that negative negative is positive, basically meaning that the patient does not even have albright hereditary osteodystrophy. Okay, so the thing is, it's pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism. Pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism pseudo -pseudo -hypoparathyroidism is the same problem that is, patients have uh, a, a mutation in a gene. The gene mutation is the same, that is, uh, GNAS gene. The only difference between albright hereditary osteodystrophy and pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism is that in Albright hereditary osteodystrophy, the mutation was in the maternal allele. The mutation is in the maternal allele, meaning that this, there's a maternal transmitted uh, mutation. And in pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism, pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroid, the mutation is in the paternal allele. Very good. Okay, one from the mother, one from the father. 
if the mutation is coming from the mother, then we get albright failure osteodystrophy where we have parathyroid resistance. If the mutation is coming from the father, then we do not even get anything. Uh, the parathyroid will work properly. But why do we call this pseudo pseudo? Everything will be normal. Parathyroid will be normal. Calcium will be normal. Phosphate will be normal because there is no problem with the second messenger system. But the only thing is the physical finding, the physical examination and the physical finding of pseudo pseudo hyperparathyroidism is the same as Albright ADPS to osteodystrophy. The patients will have short stature and they will have hands that look like this. Short fourth and fifth, fifth digits. Uh, short stature and mild development of delay, but their thyroid, calcium, and phosphate levels will remain normal. Yes, phenotype of Albert. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? So the main question is: If we have a patient who comes to you, if if you if you, if you have a patient who comes to you with um, short fourth and fifth digit short stature, developmental delay, um, high thyroid level, low calcium level, and high phosphate level, what is your diagnosis? The diagnosis is. Albright, <clears throat> Albright, hereditary osteodystrophy. If you have another patient who comes to you with short fourth and fifth digits, um, short stature, developmental delay, uh, but the patient has absolutely normal lab values, that is, their thyroid level is normal, calcium is normal, phosphate is normal. What is your diagnosis? Very good. This is fake Albright. Okay, good. This is pseudo, pseudo, hypo. Parathyroid level, okay, so we are done with all our discussions of hypoparathyroid. Now let's talk about this one over here. What would happen if I place um, a second finding in this region? What does this mean? This means that parathyroid is high, but calcium is low. Yes or no? So what do we call this? Parathyroid is high, but calcium is low. We call this hyperparathyroid, but secondary. Secondary hyperparathyroid. What, what do we mean by secondary and primary hyperparathyroidism? Okay, try to understand this. Primary hyperparathyroid basically means that there's a carcinoma or an adenoma, meaning that the problem is in the gland. Secondary means that there's an indirect stimulation of the parathyroid gland, especially due to low calcium level. So what are some of the reasons why we can have low calcium and high parathyroid? Can anyone tell me? In secondary hyperparathyroid, the problem could be that patients can have deficiencies of what? Vitamin D, yes or no? Vitamin D deficiency, one of the most common diseases. Then patients can have uh, <laughs> nutritional deficiencies where they do not eat or drink enough nutritious food containing calcium. And so nutritional deficiency could be another one. Another one is kidney. CKD. If we have CKD, then what, how can we get uh, hypocalcemia? Uh, in CKD, we have decreased activity of one of our hydroxylase, and parathyroid cannot uh, work properly in the visual conduit tubule. So that's that. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, this is secondary hyperparathyroid. Next one is over here. If we have a uh, finding over here, what does this mean? Low and parathyroid and low calcium or high parathyroid and high calcium. That is. Very good. Is this primary, secondary? The answer is this is primary. Okay, this is primary hyperparathyroidism. What, is, what are the common causes of primary hyperparathyroid? This, there could be carcinomas, there could be adenomas, there could be hyperphagia. It, it could be a part of men. One and two. Okay. okay, if we have something over here, that are tired is low, but calcium is excessively high. What is the reason for this? Two things, right? Number one, if that are tired is low, but calcium is high, can anyone tell me what is the reason for this? Calcium is very high, that are tired is low. Very good. This is due to not too much calcium or too much vitamin D. Uh, whenever we get too much calcium or too much vitamin D, we, it's impossible to get hypercalcemia because of normal uh, body homeostasis. So that's that. If it's a pathology, 
then we have to think about two things. Number one, very good. Number one is carcinoma, especially lung carcinoma, where squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, where you get ectopic secretion of parathyroid hormone peptide. Another one is granulomatous diseases. In granulomatous diseases, we have sarcoidosis and tuberculosis. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Okay. And sometimes excessive calcium and vitamin D are also the cause, which uh, Dr. Ellen has just mentioned. Too much calcium or too much vitamin D, but uh, it usually does not cause a disease because always remember, whenever we take too much of anything, if your body is not undergoing a disease or a pathology, then your normal homeostatic mechanisms will make sure that the levels remain normal, right? So uh, until and unless there is loss of homeostasis, having too much calcium or vitamin D will not cause these sort of problems. Are we clear, everyone? Okay. Let's come back to our lecture. Let's see what we have. Let's see what we have studied from over here. Um, oh, one more thing. I want to talk about this table before I move forward very quickly. Okay. Um, so let's talk about this table very quickly. I need you guys to help me out with this. <laughs> so we have calcium, phosphate, and parathyroid. Okay. Calcium, phosphate, and parathyroid. First one is let's talk about um, primary hyperparathyroidism. What would happen if the calcium level has chances increased? Calcium level is going to be high or low in primary hyperparathyroid. High, very good. Why will calcium level be low in primary hyperparathyroid? Once again, what is the cause of primary hyperparathyroid? Adenoma and carcinomas, yes or no? Yes, adenomas and carcinomas. So primary hyperparathyroid will cause calcium resorption in the bone and they will cause increased calcium. What would happen if the phosphate level will be high or low? And chances please, they will be high or low? Low, there you go. Parathyroid will be high or low? Very good. Okay, secondary parathyroid. Calcium high or low? Low. Phosphate high or low? Wait, before we answer phosphate, let's talk about parathyroid level, high or low? High. Okay. Now let's talk about phosphate in two things. Number one, if it's a CKD patient, what would happen to the phosphate level? High. Why? Because the kidney is not functioning properly, so the parathyroid cannot get rid of the phosphates in the body. That's a bit of a defective appearance. Okay, next one is Albright hereditary osteodystrophy. What would happen to the calcium level? We just talked about this. Parathyroid cannot work properly. Calcium level is going to be low. Phosphate is going to be. Phosphate is going to be high. Very good. Parathyroid is going to be. High. Okay. What would happen to um, pseudo, pseudo hypoparathyroid? All normal. Okay. Let's talk about nutritional deficiencies. Vitamin D or calcium deficiency. Obviously, calcium is going to be high or low. Calcium is going to be low. Phosphate is going to be high or low. The kidney is functioning properly. Low. Thyroid is going to be high or low. Okay. Are we clear, everyone? Yes or no? Uh, let's look at the book over here. Okay. We talked about this. Hypoparathyroidism, as you can see, uh, you, we have two types of findings. Uh, either we can get the Vostic sign, we can get the Brousseau sign for hypocalcemia. And we talked about this Vostic sign is tapping on the facial nerve, will cause compression of the facial muscles, and occlusion of the brachial artery will cause carpal spasm. Uh, the most common cause of hypoparathyroid is due to the parathyroid glands and autoimmune destruction or Dijon syndrome. That's right. Findings are very simple, kidney, hypocalcemia, and hypophosphatemia. So that's it. Okay, 
pseudo hyperparathyroidism type 1a it's an autosomal dominant disease also known as albright a degree osteodystrophy please remember the labs extremely important physical findings are very important okay um the pathology however if you can understand the pathology that's okay you do not have to remember it but i mean you have to remember it but you do not have to basically study it because it's not asked in the questions so i'm going to use my uh blue pen to sort of talk about the pathology okay i'm going to use the blue marker over here for this one okay so what is pseudo pseudo once again labs high yield physical findings high yield this is also an autosomal dominant. Another one that you need to focus is Albright ADG is maternally transmitted. Uh, pseudo hypoparathyroidism is paternally transmitted. Okay. So that's basically what it is. Um, lab values in hypercalcemia, very high yield. So you now have to remember this. We talked about this right now. Let's move forward to hyperparathyroidism. Okay. That's it. Before we talk about hyperparathyroidism, can we take a short break of 10 to 15 minutes? Yes or no? Are you guys understanding, enjoying the lecture? Is there any issues with the voice? Is there any issues with the lecture that you want to let me know? Is there anything you guys are having difficulty in understanding? Okay, is there any difficulty in understanding the lecture? Okay, so thank you so much. Um, I'll move on with the rest of the topic in 10 to 15 minutes. Let's take a short break and then let's come back. It's 10.55 as of right now. Let's take a break to 11.10.
Yeah. Okay, is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Yes or no? Is everyone back? Yeah. Um, no, I, I oh. oh, are we ready to begin? Okay. Oh, if you get a patient with short stature, short um, fourth and fifth digit death and developmental delay and normal lab values, what is your diagnosis? Zero, zero. Very good. Okay, so let's start talking about another sort of a condition. Let's start talking about, we talked about hypoparathyroid. Now let's talk about hyperparathyroid. Okay. Now, so far we talked about primary, we talked about secondary. What we didn't talk about was we can talk about tertiary or third degree hypothyroidism. Now, before I jump into primary and secondary, let's talk about tertiary hyperparathyroid level. It's not very high yield. We just have to understand what's happening over here. So if we have a patient with, um, if we have a patient with, let's say um, chronic kidney disease, right? For example, let's say that this is your patient who has a kidney disease, right? This is your patient who has, a, who has a kidney disease. In this patient, initially, since the, the, this patient is suffering from CKD, the 1-alpha hydroxylase activity in this patient is going to be low, right? If 1-alpha hydroxylase activity is going to be low, the calcium level initially will be low, right? The calcium level initially in these patients, they will be low. If it's low, then what would happen to the parathyroid hormone level? The parathyroid hormone level is going to be higher low the parathyroid hormone level will be high. And this is usually the case in secondary hyperparathyroidism. But, but what would happen in long-term kidney disease? So we're talking about the patient suffering from CKD for let's say five years, 10 years. So long-term long CKD, what would happen to these patients? In long-term CKD, what would happen is that um, the Parathyroid glands <clears throat> will be so sensitive. For example, let's say that uh, this is your parathyroid, this is your thyroid gland, and over here you have the four parathyroids. In long-term CKD, the parathyroid glands will be so sensitive that even without stimulation, even without stimulation of the calcium, they will secrete parathyroid without any stimulus. So this is called, another name for this one is refractory. Refractory, or in a very simple word, I will say habit or habituated. For example, let me, see, let me tell you, uh, let me give you an example. Um, what do we do when we wake up in the morning? The first thing that we do when we wake up in the morning is what? We brush our teeth, wash our face, right? right? And then we have breakfast. We have been doing this for years, for 10 years, for 20 years, right? So isn't that our, our habit, right? Isn't that our habit? Yes or no? That even before, even when we wake up in the morning, do we think about, or do we have to make a calculated decision whether we have to go to the bathroom or not, or do we just go to the bathroom? That's answer, please. <clears throat> do we make a decision or are we habituated, okay? So when we wake up in the morning, we usually do not make a calculated decision whether we should or shouldn't go to the washroom. We just go to the washroom because the answer is we have been doing this for so many years that these uh, that this habit, they come naturally. So a parathyroid gland of a patient who's suffering from CKD is so habituated to secrete parathyroid 
that even without CKD, or let's say that a CKD patient undergoes nephrectomy, right? Yes, CKD patient with, who undergoes nephrectomy, these patients, they will still keep on secreting high amount of parathyroid level, high amount of parathyroid. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? Did you guys understand the tertiary concept? Okay. So this is basically tertiary hyperparathyroid. At one point, this excessive secretion of parathyroid hormone level, we know that the parathyroid, it works in the bones and it also uh, works in the kidneys, right? At one point, this excessive parathyroid hormone level, will it not activate the osteoclast, yes or no, from the bone and increase calcium resorption? Yes. So initially, even though in secondary hyperparathyroidism, the calcium level was low in CKD, at one point in long-term CKD, due to calcium resorption from the bone, these patients will actually end up having high parathyroid and high calcium. This is the concept of tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Are we clear? Yes or no? Everyone? So, in so what are the causes of tertiary hyperparathyroid? Number one, long-term CKD. <coughs> Excuse me, my apologies. Long-term CKD. Another one is nephrectomy uh, or or nephrectomy after the patient suffers from long-term CKD. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay. Okay. So since this is out of the way, the amount of questions which you guys will receive from tertiary hyperparathyroidism is not high. So tertiary hyperparathyroidism is basically a concept which you have to understand, but uh, you will not be asked a lot of questions on tertiary hyperparathyroidism. What you will be asked on is this one, that is primary hyperparathyroidism. Primary hyperparathyroidism, what are the causes? Once again, the causes are simple. The causes are carcinomas, adenomas, <clears throat> and hyperplasia. Am I correct or not? Yes or not? Is this good or not? Yes? No? So, what happens is over here in primary hyperparathyroidism, the patients, they have excessive amount of calcium. If you have excessive amount of calcium, there are some of the things which you need to understand is that the patient will come to you with clinical sign symptoms as such. For example, number one, if you start from the head, the patients will get neuropsychiatric disturbance, or we say, um, for example, the patient get, get mildly depressed, the patient can suffer from mild dementia. Next one. The next thing is uh, over here in the kidneys, the patients can get what? Stones, calcium phosphate stones, yes. Okay. Then in the GI tract, the patients will get what? Constipation. And excessive calcium will lead to excessive urination, right? So polyuria. These are the sign symptoms of hypercalcemia. Uh, am I clear? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Can I get some feedback in the chat box, please? Is this clear or not? Okay. Now let's talk about this one. Let's talk about the bones. In the bones, the calcium, the parathyroid will come, right? And what will the parathyroid do? They will increase the osteoblastic activity. Osteoblasts will accept, uh, will express rank, and they will activate osteoclast. Osteoclast will then cause calcium resorption, right? So when there is calcium resorption from the bone, isn't there a possibility that, that the bone can get a little bit of this sort of damage, yes or no? Yes. Okay. So whenever there is damage or inflammation, what is the last stage of inflammation? Isn't it um, recovery or fibrosis? Yes or no? The last stage of inflammation is recovery or fibrosis. So whenever there is uh, parathyroid hormone activity in the bones and then there's calcium resorption, it is replaced by 
fibrous tissue, right? It is replaced by fibrous tissue. And this fibrous tissue is brown in color. So there is brown fibrous deposition in the tissues. We call this condition, can anyone name the condition? This is called osteitis fibrosa cystica. Are we clear, yes or no? This is called osteitis fibrosa cystica, okay? So if anyone asks you, um, if you have a patient who has cystic bone lesions with fibrous, brown fibrous tissue replacement, this, what is your diagnosis? Cystic bone lesion plus brown fibrous deposition. What is your diagnosis? The diagnosis is osteitis fibrosa cystica. Okay, are we clear, yes or no? Okay, next one. Next one is um, your secondary hyperparathyroid. Okay, next one is secondary hyperparathyroid. In secondary hyperparathyroid, there's another thing I wanna talk about. Um, the same thing in secondary hyperparathyroid, the number one cause is chronic kidney disease. As a result, calcium is going to be low. Parathyroid is going to be high. When parathyroid is high, once again, initially, will it not also activate the osteoclastic activity in the bones in a, in a patient of chronic kidney disease? Yes or no? Yes, to increase the calcium. Okay. But since the calcium level initially is low, in chronic kidney disease, we call the secondary hyperparathyroid. At one point, if there's excessive calcium resulting from the bone and the calcium level increases and the parathyroid hormone level also increases, what do we call that type of parathyroidism? Tertiary or second, uh, secondary or tertiary? We call that as tertiary or secondary? Tertiary, very good. But right now, since the calcium level is low and parathyroid hormone is high, patient is still suffering from short-term CKD, there will be parathyroid activity in the bones of these patients, right? There will be parathyroid activity in the bones of these patients. Now, whenever you have parathyroid activity in the bones of a patient suffering from renal causes, we call this syndrome or condition as renal osteodystrophy. It's basically the same thing over and over again, okay? Bone damage due to renal causes, due to high activity of parathyroid hormone level is renal osteodystrophy. Bone damage due to high parathyroid hormone level due to carcinoma adenoma is called osteitis fibrosa cystica. Are we clear about these concepts? Yes. Okay. So quick questions, quick answers. Bone damage due to hyperparathyroidism due to carcinomas adenoma. What is your diagnosis, oh, oh, very good. Bone damage due to CKD, short-term CKD. Bone damage due to short-term CKD, what is your diagnosis? Renal osteodystrophy. At one point in long-term CKD, will the parathyroid glands get oversensitive to stimulate parathyroid hormone level? The answer is yes. And if there's increased calcium due to the activity of long-term high release of parathyroid hormone level, what, what type of hyperparathyroid is this? What type of hyperparathyroidism is this? This is tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Okay, good. Um, now, I wanna talk about another thing over here. Last thing, that is familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. What is familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia? Okay, is everyone ready, yes or no? Now, uh, let's do this. This is your thyroid gland with the parathyroid glands. Okay. Um, this is your bone. This is your patient's kidney. 
Okay, now. Parathyroid will be released from the parathyroid gland. They will cause the release of calcium. And from here, they will cause the release of vitamin D. Vitamin D will work in deep intestines to release more calcium, right? And all of these calcium, this one and this one, they will have a negative feedback on the parathyroid gland. Okay. Isn't this the normal homeostatic mechanism of parathyroid, yes or no? Okay, yes or no. Is this the normal homeostatic mechanism of the parathyroid gland, yes or no? Fast habit, please. Yes, okay, now. The next thing I wanna talk about is, in order, in order for parathyroid to stop secreting parathyroid, in order for the parathyroid gland to stop secreting parathyroid, it needs to have a feedback from the calcium. Yes or no? This calcium has to have a feedback. Yes. So these are the calcium receptors in the parathyroid glands. So calcium will come, they will bind to the calcium receptors in the parathyroid glands, especially. And whenever the parathyroid gland senses that the calcium level in the blood is normal, eight to 10, then they will stop the secretion of parathyroid hormone. Now, this is the normal physiology. What is the pathology? The pathology is, what if, what if these receptors, these calcium sensing receptors in the parathyroid glands are defective? What if they are not working properly? What if they're defective? If they are defective, can the parathyroid gland sense that the normal level of calcium in the blood has been reached? Yes or no? Which one? Fast answers. The answer is no. So they are not aware of the normal level of calcium in the blood. So isn't there a possibility they will keep on secreting parathyroid hormone level? I mean, parathyroid hormone. Yes or no? So they will keep on secreting parathyroid hormone. Yes or no? Okay. So if they keep on secreting parathyroid hormone, will there be excessive calcium reabsorption from the kidney? Yes or no? There will be excessive calcium reabsorption from the kidney. Will there be excessive calcium reabsorption from the bones? Yes or no? The answer is yes, there will be excessive calcium reabsorption from the bone. And if there is excessive calcium reabsorption from the kidney, what would happen to the calcium level in urine? Will it be high or will it be low? It will be low. So, so, what is familial hyper familial hyper calcemic hypo calcemia familial because this is a name of a this is a familial sort of a predominance where there is a deficiency of calcium sensing receptor in the parathyroid gland and also in the kidneys to some extent. As a result, the normal amount of calcium is not being able to suppress the release of parathyroid hormone from the parathyroid gland. As a result, this high amount of parathyroid will increase the calcium absorption from the intestines and reabsorption from the kidneys. And we will get hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia. Does this make sense? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Does this make sense? Oh, okay. Do you guys have any questions? If you guys have questions, you can ask me now. If you guys have difficulty understanding anything, I can repeat myself. Because if you don't, then I'll move on to diabetes colitis. Fast answers, please. Can I get a quick response in the chat box? Yes or no? If you have questions or no questions. 
Is there any change in magnesium level? No. No question. Okay. If, the, if you guys don't have any questions, then let's begin with this page over here, hyperparathyroidism, primary hyperparathyroid, as you can see, cystic bone lesions in the bones, indicating that this is a case of osteitis fibrosis cystica. Uh, okay. So once again, blue pen, red pen, red pen for questions, blue pen for potential questions. Please underline this, sign symptoms of hypercalcemia. You have to know that they cause stones, thrones, groans, and overtones. This is basically a mnemonic, stones, thrones, bones, groans, and psychiatric overtones. This is basically meaning that there's renal stones, uh, then we have bone pain, right? Abdominal pain and depression or dementia. So that's it. Another thing is always remember when there's excessive activity of parathyroid uh, hormone level, right? There is alkaline phosphatase, increased alkaline phosphatase activity because once again, acidic, it tries to create uh, basically an acidic environment. And as a result, alkaline phosphatase like level increases a little bit. And um, increase of urinary CMP. I think I talked about all of these things in the first lectures. Do you, do you guys remember I talked about this? Hydroxyproline, urinary CMP. Yes, okay, so I'm not gonna repeat myself. Do you guys remember that? Yes or no? Okay, good. Next one, osteitis fibrosa cystica, the cystic bone uh, spaces filled with brown fibrous tissue over here consisting of osteoclasts and deposit hemosiderin from, hem from hemorrhages over here. So not only do you have fibrosis, you also have a little bit of hemosiderin deposition. Hemosiderin is basically iron containing glue that is deposited in the spaces, resulting in the brown uh, fibrous tissue as we see over here. So that's that. Secondary hyperparathyroidism is due to decreased calcium absorption and increased phosphate. The most common cause is chronic kidney disease. Patients can get hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia. We talked about this. And we also talked about renal osteodystrophy, as we can see in both secondary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism. In tertiary hyperparathyroidism, the parathyroid hormone gets very sensitive to be stimulated from long-term CKD. As a result, parathyroid hormone will be excessively released. As you can see, that they use two signs over here to indicate that. And at one point, due to excessive calcium resorption from the bone, calcium will also increase. Uh, this is familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, which we talked about, where we have defective calcium sensory receptors in parathyroid and kidneys. As a result, we need higher than normal calcium level to suppress the parathyroid, and excessive renal calcium reabsorption can cause mild hypercalcemia and hypercalcemia. Okay. Over here, we write down one thing um, for familial hypocalcium unit hypercalcium. I write this down. Parathyroid calcium. Okay. Phosphate. Parathyroid will be high. Calcium concentration will be high. Phosphate will be low. Same as um, parathyroid adenoma. Are we clear, Mr. Hope? Okay, now let's begin diabetes mellitus. Is everyone ready about diabetes or diabetes mellitus? <clears throat> no. Diabetes mellitus, okay. Uh, this will not need any blank page or anything else, but um, okay. let me use the blank page for one quick discussion before I start talking about diabetes mellitus. So basically what is diabetes mellitus? Diabetes mellitus is either insulin there is a deficiency of insulin or insulin cannot function properly, right? We have moved over to a different heart rate. We're gonna talk about insulin. Okay. Insulin, either in type one diabetes, what happens? Insulin production is decreased due to autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic islet cells or in type two diabetes mellitus, what is the problem? The problem is, there is insulin secretion, but insulin cannot work properly due to insulin resistance. Is that correct or not? Yes or no? That's nice, please. Okay, now. Um, I want to talk about this. What happens is um, in patients of diabetes, 
especially what they have, the problem is that these patients, they have uncontrollably high glucose level, right? The glucose level of these patients remains very high. And due to these high glucose level, we get some issues. We get some issues and we get, we get some problems. Now, there are two types of issues that we get with high glucose level. Glucose is known for two properties. Okay, so I'm gonna use layman terms to make you guys understand that glucose is sticky and glucose is osmotically active. Thank okay. you. Have you guys ever uh, crushed a piece of rice in between your fingers? Yes or no, I think you guys have. Yes or no? Or have you guys crushed a piece of bread in between your fingers? If you guys did, and bread and rice, they're, they're high in carbohydrates. Did you feel that they were sticking onto your fingers? Yes or no? Did you, did you feel that they were sticking onto your fingers? The answer is yes. When you do the same thing with meat, do you feel, do you have a sensation of the meat sticking to your fingers? Yes or no? The answer is no, right? But carbohydrates, especially uh, rice, bread, and all of those things, they're, they're, they're high in glucose, right? So they tend to stick to your hand. The same thing goes for blood vessels. The same thing goes for blood vessels. So blood vessels, when they are carrying glucose for a high amount of glucose for a long period of time, what happens is that these glucose, they tend to stick to the walls of the blood vessels. Okay. These glucose, they tend to stick to the walls of the blood vessels. As a result, what happens? If they stick to the walls of the blood vessels, um, first and foremost, the membrane does it get thick? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. Next one is as a result, if they get thick, do they get weak? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay. So what happens is um, if they get thick and weak, um, in order to maintain the normal balance, of um, homeostasis in the blood vessels. Uh, whenever the blood vessels are getting weak or thick, they release some growth factors, for example, vascular endothelial growth factors, uh, EDRF, right? These growth factors, they are more or less they release. And these sorts of growth factors, what they do is they cause angiogenesis or vessel proliferation, right? Have I made myself clear, yes or no? Right. Since they're getting thick, they're getting weak, they start releasing growth factors and they cause vascular proliferation. That's that. Another type of damage that we see is due to the fact that glucose is an osmotically active substance. For example, uh, have you guys heard of people who are lactose intolerant, yes or no? Yes, I'm pretty sure you guys have had, right? Because Right. We're all physicians. I'm pretty sure we have heard of lactose intolerance. Lactose is also a sort of um, simple, uh, it's, it's also a type of simple carbohydrate. Uh, do we get lactose intolerance because lactose cannot be broken down due to absence of lactase? The answer is yes. As a result, what happens? Does it um, absorb a lot of water into the GI tract? The answer is yes. As a result, patients get diarrhea after they drink milk or half cheese or any other dairy product. The same thing goes with glucose. Glucose is osmotically very active. So glucose long-term, if it stays for a long period of time, glucose is converted to a very highly osmotically active substance that we call uh, sorbitol. And sorbitol, it accumulates uh, in organs, especially with does, which does not have this. There's an enzyme that breaks down sorbitol. That the name of that enzyme is sorbitol dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase. And the enzyme that converts glucose to sorbitol is called aldose reductase. Aldose reductase. Aldose reductase will convert glucose to sorbitol. And there's an enzyme that will break down sorbitol to glucose. The name of that enzyme is sorbitol dehydrogenase. Have I made myself clear? Yes or no? So in order for sorbitol, in order for sorbitol to accumulate in organs, 
they need to have high aldose reductase and low sorbitol dehydrogenase. Because if they have high aldose reductase, then glucose will be converted to sorbitol. But if they have low sorbitol dehydrogenase, that means sorbitol will not be converted to glucose. As a result, will there be accumulation of sorbitol in the tissues? Yes or no? The answer is yes. If there is, then will it, um, will it basically uh, absorb water from the surrounding, uh, from, from the extracellular environment? The answer is yes. As a result, will there be damage? The answer is yes. So what are the organs that are high in aldose reductase and low in sorbitol? The number one organ are the, yes, lens or eyes. That's why we get cataracts or uh, uh, retinal damages. Another one is the peripheral nervous system, the myelin sheets of the peripheral nervous system. That's why we get diabetic neuropathies. Are we clear, yes or no? Yes. Okay. That's it. Okay. Uh, another thing that I want to talk about. Um, another thing that I want to talk about is let's talk about. Okay. That's it. Let's talk about this thing over here. Let's say this is a nerve. Um, and let's say that this is a blood vessel. Okay. So this is a nerve and this is a blood vessel. Now, my question to you guys is the nerve, this piece of nerve and this piece of blood vessel, if it has to remain viable, does it need to have a blood supply? Yes or no? A single piece of nerve? Does it need to have blood supply? Yes or no? Or can, it serve, or can they survive without blood? The blood vessel, do they need their own blood supply or do they survive without blood? The answer is, do they need blood supply or not? Thank you so much. They need blood supply, right? But this is a very obvious answer. The blood supply of the nerves, there are very small blood supplies of the nerves. Okay. And there are very small nerve supplies, I mean, blood supplies of the blood vessels, which remains the blood vessels and the nerve, which keeps them viable. What are the names of these blood supplies? This is called vasa nervosum or Casa nervosa, vasa nervosum. Okay, this is called vasa nervosa. This is called vasa vasorum. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> in order for uh, high glucose to damage blood vessel, will it be easier for glucose to damage uh, large blood vessels or small blood vessels? Which one? That answers, please. It will be easier for glucose to damage small blood vessels because it's easier to accumulate. And then once they accumulate, it's easier to do damage. Deep. So in diabetes, we can get vasculitis, right? The chances of getting vasculitis or vessel damage or vessel inflammations are very high. And nerve-wise, we can get neuritis or peripheral neuritis, right? That's why we get the uh, peripheral right? The that's why we get a sort of a sensation called uh, glove and stocking pattern. What happens during winter? Do we wear gloves and stockings? Yes or no? Do we wear gloves and stockings? Right? When we wear gloves and stockings, do we feel anything in our hands or in our feet? Do we feel the cold? Do we feel the temperature? The answer is no. So that's the same sort of feeling we will get if there is long-term hyperglycemia in diabetes. Are we clear? Why will we get them? Because in diabetes mellitus, there is damage of the vasopressorum and the vasonervosum. Okay. Okay. 
What are the signs symptoms of that diabetes? Can anyone tell me the signs symptoms of diabetes mellitus? What are the signs symptoms of diabetes? It starts with P's. Well, what are the P's? Polyuria. Polydipsia. And polyphagia. Very good. Okay. So let's start talking about diabetes mellitus, acute manifestations and chronic manifestations. Acute manifestations of diabetes will get polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia, we can get weight loss, right? And uh, complication wise, we will get type 1 diabetes. That's that. Rarely can be caused by unopposed secretion of growth hormone. This is very rare because we know growth hormone increases your blood glucose level. So uh, if there's someone who is suffering from acromegaly, they, they are prone to develop diabetes. So they're diabetogenic. We talked about this already. And also in the long term glucocorticoid therapy. If someone is taking corticosteroids for a long period of time, for example, due to SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, or fibrosis, or any other disease, patients can get steroid diabetes. What is steroid diabetes? That is the corticosteroids increase, increasing insulin resistance. As a result, they develop diabetes. That's that. Chronic complications, long-term hyperglycemia can cause non-enzymatic glycation. This non-enzymatic glycation is the word we use for sticking of the glucose to the walls of the blood vessels. So that's that. As a result, we can get small vessel disease. There's thickening of the basement membrane. So we will get retinopathies, microaneurysm, and vessel proliferations. The vessel, pro uh, the vessel proliferation we have over here is due to the activity of vascular endothelial growth factors and all the other growth factors. That's that. Patients can get glaucoma, nephropathy, that's okay. Okay, question wise, uh, you will get questions not from any one of these things. It's because uh, you have to understand the concept for, and, and, and apply it later. So try to understand from over here. So I'm going to use my blue pen instead of the red pen for this one. So small vessel damage, retinopathy, um, exudative microaneurysm, and vessel proliferation. You'll learn about diabetic retinopathy in details when we study ophthalmo, uh, when we study um, uh, the eye diseases in central nervous system. So that's that. Uh, basically in ophthalmology. And uh, that's so right now, you do not have to remember what happens in that, but if we're not that you learn them later. But as a rule of thumb, you can try to remember that in retinopathies, since there will be damage of the retinal blood vessels, we can get hemorrhage, aneurysm, and vessel proliferation. Next one is um, another thing over here is that in, in kidneys, the, there is a very high yield thing which I should mention that is over here, if this is the glomerulus. This is the efferent arterioles and the efferent arterioles, right? Efferent and the efferent arterioles. Due to non-enzymatic glycation, the efferent arterioles will get, the size, the lumen of the efferent arterioles will get small, right? As a result, when blood comes to, to the glomerulus from here to here, can they easily pass through? The answer is no. So will they be hyperfiltrated? Yes or no? The answer is, will there be hyperfiltration? Why will we have hyperfiltration in diabetic nephropathy? In diabetic nephropathy, there is a non-enzymatic glycation of the efferent arterioles. Efferent arterioles are the arterioles that will carry the blood away. So there will be non-enzymatic glycation. As a result, blood cannot pass through easily. So blood will excessively get filtered out. When blood gets excessively filtered out, will, will, will there be damage to the glomerulus or no damage to the glomerulus? Fast answers, please. There will be damage or no, no damage? Fast answers. Damage, very well. Whenever we get damage, what happens? Do we get fibrosis and sclerosis? Yes or no? Yes, that's why in diabetic nephropathy, we get this small, let's say this is the glomerulus. In the glomerulus, you see small types of sclerotic nodules. Does anyone know the name of this nodule? This is called KW nodules or Kimmel style Wilson nodules. Have you guys heard of Kimmel style Wilson nodules? You don't know. We'll, I think we'll study this in details when we talk about um, when we study nephrology. So that's that. Okay, next one. There could be 
arteriosclerosis and CKD. Oh, the reason why I talked about this is what do we give to our patients to prevent hyperfiltration damage to the kidneys and diabetes? Um, what we give is we know that angiotensin constricts the efferent arterioles, right? For example, if I talk about this over here, are we aware that this hormone angiotensin, right? Angiotensin, for example, this is afferent, the medullus, this is e this is afferent, this is efferent. Angiotensin will constrict the efferent arterial, right? Because angiotensin needs to make sure that the uh, renin is properly stimulated by the renin angiotensin aldosterone to maintain normal homeostasis. But in a patient with diabetes who already has thickening of the efferent arterioles, do we need angiotensin to constrict the efferent arterioles even further? Yes or no? No. Okay. So if angiotensin constricts the efferent arterioles even further, we will get even further hyperfiltration damage and there will be mirrorless and there will be excessive progression of the CKD. So what we give is we get angiotensin converting enzymes. This is, exceptionally, this is exceptionally important for step one, step two CK. The patients of diabetes, they are given ACE inhibitors. If they ask you why, we give them to make sure that angiotensin is not activated. Are we clear, everyone, so that we can prevent hyperfiltration damage? Okay, so this is high yield. I'm going to use my red marker for this. ARBs are renal protective angiotensin receptor blockers. Okay. ACE and aldosterone receptor blockers. Angiotensin receptor blockers, my fault, it's not aldosterone receptor blockers. Angiotensin receptor blockers and angiotensin These are renal protection. Okay, next one, osmotic damage. We talked about this, sorbitol will accumulate in organs with high aldose and low sorbitol, out of which eyes and nerve, facial nerves are the reason. Patients can get damage of the peripheral nerve and autonomic nervous system. That's why we can get diseases such as uh, gastroparesis, diabetic gastroparesis, and diabetic diarrhea. Can anyone tell me what we give for our patients for diabetic gastroparesis? For diabetic gastroparesis, what do we give to our patients to promote gastric motility? We give two drugs. We give metoclorphamide and Erythromycin, very good. Very good, okay. These are the two drugs that we give to our patients to promote gastric motility. Okay. That's that. Diagnosis, how do you diagnose a patient of diabetes? It's very simple. First and foremost, patients will come to you with signs and symptoms of polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia. You can do a hemoglobin A1C, which will reflect the glycemic control in the last three months. Uh, it should be less than six. If it's more than 6.5, then this shows that the patient has had high blood glucose for a long period of time. But first and foremost, the first test we do is a fasting plasma glucose test. If it's more than 126, then we do an OGTT, two hours glucose tolerance test. And that is, uh, we give the patient 75 grams of glucose in water, and then we try to see how the glucose response, uh, does, it get, uh, re does it get taken up by the skeletal muscle and the adipose tissue? If it does, then it should be less than 200. If there's uh, diabetes, then skeletal muscle and adipose tissue will not be able to take up the glucose as a result, it would be more than 200. So that's it. And we can also do a random, if it, in randomly if it's more than 200, then it's also diagnostic of diabetes colitis. Okay, are we clear, yes or no? Okay. Let's talk about uh, the biochemical disruption of severe insulin deficiency leading to hyperglycemia and uh, leading to diabetic ketoacidosis. Huh? So what happens when we have insulin deficiency or severe insulin deficiency? Okay. You guys can help me out with this insulin deficiency or insulin resistance. What do we get? First of all, um, if we have insulin deficiency, okay, if we have insulin deficiency, 
which hormone will work more if insulin is not there? Flash answers, please. Absence of insulin will increase the activity of, thank you so much, Dr. Nagar. The answer is glucagon. What is the function of glucagon? Will it increase the activity? I mean, will it increase the level of blood glucose or decrease the level of blood glucose? Flash answers, please. It will increase the level of blood glucose. In our body, what are the two ways you can increase blood glucose? Either via the process of gluconeogenesis or via the process of not glycolysis. The glycolysis means breaking down glucose. The, an the answer is glycogenolysis. Yes? Yes or no? So for glycolysis, uh, I mean, for gluconeogenesis, my apologies, for gluconeogenesis, where do we get the substrates for gluconeogenesis to make glucose? Where do we get the substrate from? We get them from amino acids. Very good. And lipids. So in order to get amino acids and lipids, do we need to have increased breakdown of proteins and fat? Yes or no? no. This increased breakdown of protein and fat will increase your gluconeogenesis, right? And glycogenolysis, whenever we break down glucose, uh, whenever we break down glycogen, uh, we will increase the level of glucose, okay? Increase the level of glucose. Also gluconeogenesis will also increase the level of glucose. Also, Insulin, if there is no insulin, will there be increased uptake of glucose by the skeletal muscle and the adipose tissue? Yes or no? Will there be increased uptake by the skeletal muscle? No. If there is no increased uptake, insulin deficiency will directly also increase the glucose level. As a result, what happens? If there is a high amount of glucose in the blood, what would happen to the serum osmolarity of the blood? Will, will it be hyperosmolar or hypoosmolar? It will be hyperosmolar, so increased serum osmolarity. This increased serum osmolarity will stimulate the hypothalamus and patients will get what? Patients will get thirsty. Okay. Okay. Let me ask a very difficult question. Um, does anyone know the name of, okay. Does anyone know what circumventricular organ means? What do, you, what do we mean by circumventricular organs in the brain? Does anyone know what, does anyone know what this means? Anyone, yes or no? Uh, fast answers please in the chat box. If yes, good, if no, do they? Okay. No, so we do not know what this means, not a problem. Circumventricular organs basically means that there are some organs around the ventricles of the brain, which does not have blood brain barrier. The reason why these organs, they do not have blood brain barrier is because they want to detect the level of certain things in the blood. Out of this, they want to detect osmolarity. What is the name of the circumventricular organ that detects osmolarity? Does anyone know? Yes or no, fast answers please. Meaning which organ detects, I mean, which circumventricular organ detects osmolarity? The answer is there is an organ called OVLT. We will study this later in central nervous system. This stands for organ, organum vasculosum of lamina terminalis. Okay, this detects your CM osmolarity. And then it stimulates the hypothalamus. So the main question is, <clears throat> we, we will get thirsty. Okay, this is just a side discussion off topic. We'll study this later. Next one is, when we get high amount of um, osmolarity, serum osmolarity, will we have excessive urination or low urination? Fast answers, please. If serum osmolarity is high, we'll get excessive or low. If serum osmolarity is high, they will have osmotic diuresis. As a result, we will have increased urination. That's why we have polydipsia, polyuria. Okay, next one. Next one is um, if we break down, you know, like how we broke down lipids, right? 
if we break down a lot of lipids to make the substrates for glucose, will we also end up with ketogenesis? Because lipids are broken down to form ketone bodies. What are the ketone bodies? Acetoacetate, beta hydroxybutyrate, right? These things. So we will get increased amount of ketone bodies. If we get increased amount of ketone bodies, what would happen to the pH? Will it be high or will it be low? The answer is ketone is an acidic, uh, it creates an acidic condition and pH will be low. Okay, now if pH is low, will we hyperventilate or hypoventilate? If pH is low, the lungs would try to get rid of carbon dioxide. That's why we will hyperventilate in these respiratory areas. There's a type of uh, breathing we say, this breathing is called who's mouth breathing. Are we clear, yes or no? Yes, okay. Another thing that I wanna talk about is in a patient of diabetic ketoacidosis, do you get a sweet smell from their, from their breath? Why? Because of the ketone bodies, which one? Especially acetone. Because the ketone bodies are three in number, acetone, acetoacetate, and beta hydroxybutyrate, right? Out of which acetone is, okay, has a very distinctive sweet smell. Okay, so that's the, this is basically uh, what we have discussed over here. Uh, not high yield, but the concept is very high yield. So you need to remember the concept. The questions will not be structured from over here. Concept is important. Let's move on to type one versus type two diabetes. Okay. Before we do this, can we take another short break for five minutes? You know? Let's take another small break for five minutes. Then we can come back and finish diabetes mellitus and hopefully start cushion syndrome. If we start cushion syndrome, then we will have at least finish the problem. Okay. Let's see how far we can do today. Okay. Let's take a break for five minutes and then let's come back. Thank you.
that okay? Is everyone back from the break? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay, now. Are, are you guys understanding the lecture, enjoying the lecture, yes or no? Yes, okay, good. Please let me know if there's any issues with the lecture ever. Um, I'll repeat myself, explain the same thing over and over again. You can ask as many times as you want. There's absolutely no restrictions. The only thing is, if you have any confusion with the theories, uh, what you can do is right after the lecture ends, you can ask me as many times as you want so that we can, so that your concept is absolutely clear, okay? I wanna talk about something before I jump into the first daily text. I wanna talk about diabetic ketoacidosis one more time. Okay, is everyone ready one more time? Should I begin? Is everyone back from the break? This is very important. Okay. You guys remember how I told you that Diabetic ketoacidosis is very uh, is a very serious complication that would develop, especially when a diabetic patient is undergoing stress. Do you remember this? Does anyone know why? Okay. Let me explain this. When a patient is diabetic with no stress, diabetic minus stress. In a patient who's diabetic with no stress, they already have hyperglycemia. Just write yes or no. Yes or no. Okay. They already have insulin deficiency or resistance. Yes or no. Okay. In, in a patient with diabetes with stress, that is a patient with diabetes and stress, not only do they have high glucose and low insulin, in a stressful condition, hormones such as glucagon, cortisol, growth hormone, do they increase or not in times of stress? Mm -hmm. No. So, in times of stress, isn't there a possibility that the glucose will rise higher than normal? Higher than normal that we see in a normal diabetic patient? The answer is yes. <clears throat> right? So, what happens when we have increased um, glucose? during a stressful condition because the brain needs a high amount of glucose for its normal metabolic reasons. And in a stressful condition, the stress is a stimulus for the release of glucagon, uh, cortisol and growth hormone. This further increase in blood glucose level, what does it do? First and foremost, they increase serum osmolarity. What happens when the serum osmolarity increases excessively? brain cells, extracellular cells, brain cell. Will there be loss of water from the normal brain cell to the extracellular environment? As a result, will the cells shrink? So they will shrink, right? That's why patients get delirious or dementia, not dementia, I always say delirious. They get delirious, they, didn't, they cannot tell what is a reality and what is not the reality. They lose touch with reality. I would say psychosis is also there a little bit in diabetic ketoacidosis. Next one. Next one is the high amount of gluconeogenesis that requires comes from the breakdown of lipids by lipolysis. So we get ketone bodies which creates an acidic environment. As a result, pH decreases. If pH decreases, that must also mean that these patients, they have a high amount of hydrogen in the blood. Yes or no, that stands as piece. They have a high amount of hydrogen in the blood. Now let's talk about 
a cell, a normal cell, not a brain cell. Let's talk about a normal cell and the extracellular environment. A normal cell has a channel, this channel. This channel is called the hydrogen potassium channel. When there is a high amount, well, when there are high amount of hydrogen extracellularly, they will try to move into the cell. As a result, potassium from inside the cell will come out. So what will be the level of potassium outside the cell? Now potassium outside the cell will be high. Okay, but, but does this mean that the potassium inside the cell is excessively low? The answer is yes. All the potassium from inside the cell will start coming out. So even though the potassium outside the cell is high, the patient is in a hypokalemic state. Okay, we call this depletion of total body potassium. Have I made myself clear, yes or no? Okay, now another way we can lose potassium is when we have a high amount of serum osmolarity, do we have polyuria? The answer is yes. If we have polyuria, can we lose increased potassium through the urine? The answer is yes. Which will further contribute to depletion of potassium. So, what will a normal lab of a diabetic ketoacidotic patient look like? Can it look something like this? Glucose level. 450, potassium level 5.5, sodium level, let's say 133. Uh, or let's say the sodium level should be unaffected. So I would say 138, okay. Bicarbonate, cool. Fall, right? Let's say bicarbonate level is eight. Chloride level, let's say, is uh, further decreased. Let's say chloride is also, let's say, 100. Now, if we calculate the anion gap for this one, the calculation of anion gap is total cations, that is sodium potassium, the major cations minus the major anions, right? Which is 138. Plus 5.5 minus 100 plus 80. Okay, what is the amount? 138 plus 5.5 is around 143.5 minus 108. So it would be around 35, give or take 35.5. Okay. This 35.5 is your anion gap. Normally the anion gap in the body should not exceed more than 10 to 12. But can we say that this is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis? The answer is yes. Okay. Oh, another thing is um, what is the procedure we do to uh, calculate pH of the body and bicarbonate, pH bicarbonate and everything else? What do we do? We do. ABG, ABG stands for arterial blood gas analysis. What do we see? pH, bicarbonate, uh, PSEO2, right? These are some of the things that we see. Uh, so over here, we will see that the PSEO2 is low, bicarbonate is low, pH is low. Correct or not? Please. Okay. Now, uh, how many of us have heard of, you know, the recent, um, <clears throat> the recent thing that people were freaking out in the middle, 
people started freaking out about this so-called thing called black fungus in uh, black fungus in COVID. Do you remember how laymen and the people who spread rumors they started thinking that black fungus is basically a communicable disease, right? It's spreadable. It's not spreadable. Black fungus is nothing but mucormycosis, right? This is mucormycosis, which is caused by uh, fungi that has septate branching more than 120 degrees. I'll talk about this later. It, it's caused by fungi that has a, that has septas that are branched at, a, at an angle more than 120 degrees. This is very, very high yield. The name of this fungus is, okay, I see Dr. Ethan has already mentioned this. The name of this fungus is rhizopus. In diabetic ketoacidosis, one of the most major complications of diabetic ketoacidosis is in severe diabetic ketoacidosis, patients can get mucormycosis or rhizopus, which is characterized by a black eshkar. Usually, what is the most common site? Nose. Okay, that's that. How do we treat a patient of diabetic ketoacidosis? Did I mention this earlier? I'm not sure if I did. Number one, how do you treat a patient of diabetic ketoacidosis? First and foremost, what is the main problem of diabetic ketoacidosis? The main problem of diabetic ketoacidosis is, is increased serum osmolarity. Very good, dehydration and cere cerebral shrinkage. So the first thing we have to do is, is what? Prevent dehydration. How do you prevent dehydration? By rehydration, right? So IV fluid. Which fluid will you use? 0.9% sodium chloride or normal saline. Okay. Next, you will give insulin. Next, you will give an antibiotic. Why? Because high amount of glucose in the blood is a very potential uh, base for growth of bacteria and infections, right? So that's, that's that. And fourth, check the potassium level and potassium replenishment. <clears throat> Are we clear? Yes or no? Oh, another thing that I want to talk about is there is another condition. First and foremost, try to understand that diabetic ketoacidosis, not only diabetic ketoacidosis, is far more common in type 1 diabetes than type 2 diabetes. Why? Type 1 diabetes, there is insulin absence or complete cessation of insulin. Um, secretion. As a result, patients are more prone to develop diabetic ketoacidosis. There's another condition that we call HHS, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, which is more common in type 2 diabetes than type 1 diabetes. Um, this happens more in old patients or elderly. Type 1 diabetes is more common in young patients, right? Because it's, it's a autoimmune destruction, so it, it presents from a young age. What is hyper, uh, uh, hyper, uh, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state? In hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, the problem is not with um, your ketone body formation because over here in type two diabetes, insulin is not absent, insulin is there, insulin is present, but there's insulin resistance, so insulin cannot function properly. But this, present, this presence of insulin in the body prevents the excessive surge of what? Glucagon, cortisol, and growth hormone. Yes or no? So we usually do not get increased gluconeogenesis. That is, that comes with these three hormones. So we do not need lipolysis. So we do not get ketone bodies. But what do we get in hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state? What we do get it is increased serum osmolarity. Yes, this increased serum osmolarity once again can it also can it cause um, your serum? Um, I mean, can it cause your cerebral shrinkage? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Can patients suffer from uh, dementia, seizures, psychosis? And on and all of those things, delirium, the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, over here, the 
treatment is very simple. You have to give IV fluid to prevent dehydration or decrease osmolarity. You can give, you have to give insulin. And once again, check the potassium level for by any chance, if there is a possibility that there is again loss of potassium due to, why will we have loss of potassium over here? This is not due to intercellular shift, right? This is due to loss through what urine, due to osmotic diuresis, right? Polyuria, where then we have to repeat our potassium has to be repeated. Are we clear, yes or no? Okay, no. Uh, so that's that. Now let's begin with the first aid. Okay, first aid. What's the difference between type one and type two diabetes? Type one and type two. Okay, let's use the red marker because this is a question. Type one diabetes is an autoimmune T cell mediated destruction of beta cells. Or there could also be presence of uh, an antibody which destroys glutamic acid decarboxylase that is responsible for the production of proper amount of insulin. So that's it. So you have to remember this, that in type one diabetes, it's present from a young age, it's an autoimmune disease where we have autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic islet cells. Type two is not an autoimmune disease, it's a, a metabolic disease where we have increased insulin resistance and beta cell failure, okay? Insulin is necessary in treatment in type one, yes, all the time. In type two, no, type two, initially we start with lifestyle modification and metformin. And then initially we keep on giving more drugs depending on the glycemic control of the patient. Yes or no, last answer, please. Yes, in type two diabetes, do we give insulin from the first or do we wait for the insulin for the, do we wait to see how the patient responds to different initial drugs? Last answer. Okay, we wait, very good. Age, young age, old age. I talked about this association with obesity, type one. There is no association. Type two, yes, because increased amount of fat in the body prevents the act, prevents the activity of the insulin. As simple as that. Okay. Genetic predisposition. It's polygenic, meaning that there is um, multifactorial reasons over here. And type two diabetes is actually more strongly correlated with the genetic predisposition, meaning that if the mother or the father has type two diabetes, there's a very high chance that um, the babies can also get type two diabetes. So that's the HLA system. Uh, association with the HLA system, with this one, it says HLA BR4 and BR3 associated. This has no HLA association. Glucose intolerance, severe, mild to moderate. Insulin sens sensitivity obviously is very high because there's no problem with insulin resistance in type one. In type two, there's a problem with insulin resistance, meaning that the insulin receptors do not detect insulin properly. So insulin set sensitivity obviously is low, okay? Ketoacidosis is common, more common in type one than type two. Beta cells fall in type one because there's already immune destruction, type two. Uh, there's amyloid deposition in the beta cells, but this is only in long-term diabetes, okay? So that's that. Serum insulin level in type one will be low. In type two, it will be initially normal, but later it will decrease. Because once again, this is not insulin deficiency, this is insulin resistance. The symptoms are the same. What do we find under histology? If you please give your three stars for this. In histology, we see that there is leukocytic infiltration. Why? Because it's an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease is a chronic disease. In chronic disease, the cells are lymphocytes. And type 2 diabetes, we see depositions of proteins, which cannot be broken down by the proteases in the body, which we say, which, is, which we call amyloids. So there is eyelid amyloid polypeptide deposition. Very, very important. Okay. Are we clear? Yes or no, everyone? Right. Okay, diabetic ketoacidosis. Let's talk about this. Already we talked about how this happens. In diabetic ketoacidosis, the insulin non-compliance is there or increased requirements due to increased stress. We talked about this in excessive lipolysis and ketone bodies. Okay, this entire thing is excessively high yield. You have to remember this. Sign symptoms is very high yield. Abdominal pain, dehydration, who's more bleeding? Okay. A typical question of this one will be about a patient 
who is around eight to 15 years of age, male or female, it doesn't matter, comes to you with some sort of a fever or abdominal pain. The patient is delirious, confused. The patient has a history of type one diabetes. When you see labs, you will see glucose is high, potassium is high, right? Bicarbonate will be low. Right? And you can easily make a diagnosis that this is a patient of diabetic ketosis. Okay, what do we see in the labs? Bicarbonate will be low. Hydrogen will be high. Hyperglycemia, glucose will be high. Blood and ketone bodies will be high. Glucocytosis, why? Because glucose level in the, in the blood is high. As a result, infection chance of having infection is very high, so glucose time will be high. Serum potassium will be high, but there will be depletion of intercellular due to transcellular shift from decrease insulin and as acidosis, that's the Osmotic diuresis will also promote in potassium loss. Did you, did you guys understand why potassium level is high, but still the total body, the total body potassium in diabetic ketoacidosis is low, this one else? Okay, very good. Okay, complications, life-threatening mucormycosis. Then what else? There would be cerebral, edema or shrinkage, cardiac arrhythmias due to the potassium level in the body, that's that. And treatment is very simple, fluid, insulin, potassium, okay? Uh, if we give high amount of insulin and glucose level falls abruptly, sometimes we give insulin with glucose. So that's that, to prevent hyperglycemia. Hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state is a profound hyperglycemia due to excessive diuresis. It's seen in elderly patients. Sign symptoms are the same. Everything is the same over here, like diabetic ketoacidosis, except there is no ketone bodies in the urine or in the blood. That's the only difference. Okay. This can progress to coma and death, obviously. Okay. All right. Now, let's talk about hypoglycemia and diabetes mellitus. Hypoglycemia and diabetes mellitus it usually occurs in patients treated with insulin or insulin secreted drugs, right? For example, um, if patients in diabetes, do they take two types of insulin in a long-term state? For example, they take a short-acting insulin and a long-acting long -acting insulin, yes or no? But in, in our patients, do we ask them to take the short-acting insulin right before having breakfast, yes or no, in the morning, right? So what if they miss a meal what if they miss a meal right after they have, they arrive right after they take the insulin. If they miss a meal, isn't it possible for this excessive insulin to decrease the blood glucose level excessively in the body? Yes or no? Yes, the answer is yes. So that's why these patients, if they miss a meal, then they can get hypoglycemia. So high dose treatment, inadequate food intake or excessive exercise can cause hypoglycemia in diabetic patients. Uh, what happens in hypoglycemia? Do we get a sympathetic overload or parasympathetic overload? That's how it is. Hypoglycemia and sign, sign symptoms. Sympathetic overload. What is a sympathetic overload? Sympathetic is your fight or flight. What do we get? Sweating, tremor, perspiration, anxiety, uh, then uh, tachycardia, breathlessness, right? All of these things. So all of the sympathetic overdose will happen in over here. And due to the high amount, I mean, due to the low amount of glucose, once again, there will be compromise of the osmotic balance near the cerebral blood vessel, I mean, near the, the cerebral extracellular compartment and the brain cells. So there will be an osmotic imbalance one more time and patients can get altered mental status, seizures, death. Treatment is very simple. If the patient is conscious, meaning if the patient can eat or drink, give the patient uh, glucose containing juice, or glucose tablets, chocolates, uh, or anything else. If the patient is um, unconscious, then the first thing that we would like to give is intramuscular glucagon, which will immediately increase the blood glucose level, and then give an IV drip of dextrose. Are we clear? Yes or no? Over here, put your star mark for this one, the treatment is high. Okay. Okay. Next one is Cushing syndrome. Do you want to start Cushing syndrome today or do you guys want to start Cushing syndrome tomorrow? Last chances, please. Today or tomorrow? Last chances. 
Now, is everyone ready? Okay, good. Let's begin with Cushing syndrome. What is Cushing syndrome? Cushing syndrome is basically a condition where we have excessive release of what? Cortisol, right? Now, cortisol, we can have excessive release of cortisol by one of three ways. First and foremost, if the patient is taking, um, for example, let me talk about this over here. Okay. First and foremost, if the patient is taking cortisol from outside, that is exogenous corticosteroid. Who are these patients? These patients are patients who are suffering from long-term autoimmune diseases. Uh, if you take exogenous corticosteroid from outside, what would happen to the ACTH level in your body? Will it be high or will it be low? It will be low. As a result, what would happen to the uh, adrenal glands? Will it be hyp uh, hyperplastic, hypertrophic, or atrophic? There will be atrophic. Very simple. Okay, next one. What if there is a uh, adrenal gland tumor? In that case, there will be excessive secretion of corticosteroid and ACTH level will fall. And this is the type of primary cause of Cushing syndrome. That is adrenal carcinoma, adenoma, or hyperplasia or hypertrophy. Another one is what if there is a pituitary tumor, which is secreting a lot of ACTH. In this case, not only will the patient have signs symptoms of Cushing syndrome, the patient will also be hyperpigmented. Yes or no, fast answers, please. The patient will also be hyper, hyper pigmented. So that's that. Uh, what are the sign symptoms of Cushing syndrome? Well, we talked about this, you remember? The sign symptoms of Cushing's, of Cushing's syndrome, first and, first and foremost, patients will be in a hyperglycemic condition. Patients will have excessive deposition of fat, especially they will have um, swelling of the face, so facial swelling. We call this moon phase, right? They will have a hump. We call this buffalo hump. They will have obesity in the central part of their abdomen, which we call a centripetal obesity. Then what else will they have? They will have increased healing or decreased healing. The answer is they will have decreased healing, increased stria, right? What else? They will have hypertension. Okay. Will they have uh, menstrual irregularities? Yes or no? These patients? Yes or no? Will they have menstrual problems and menstrual irregularities? Yes. So menstrual irregularities in females. What would happen to them? Okay. What would happen to the bone? What would happen to the bone? Osteoporosis. Okay. How are you? Okay. How are you? So that's it. Um, how do we diagnose a case of Cushing syndrome? Okay. How do we diagnose a case of Cushing syndrome? Now, in order to diagnose Cushing syndrome, do we have to sort of understand why the patient has corticosteroid, high corticosteroid? Why does the patient have high amount of cortisol? There could be basically three, three reasons, right? Either he's taking from outside, increased exogenous corticosteroid, or there's a tumor in the adrenal glands, or there's a pituitary sort of problem increased pituitary secretion of um, ACTH, or there could be uh, lung cancer. 
which is secreting ectopic ACTH, so for example, small cell lung cancer? Yes or no? Okay. So first and foremost, you have a patient, you are an endocrinologist. You have a patient who comes to you with moon phase, buffalo hump, obesity, hypertension, hyperglycemia, osteoporosis, stria, neutrophilia, eosinopenia. What is your provisional diagnosis? Fast answers, please. Your provisional diagnosis is? What your provisional diagnosis is? Cushing syndrome. Next one. What do you do if you have a patient with off Cushing syndrome? First and foremost, you have to confirm your diagnosis. How? Labs. What are the labs? 24 hour free cortisol first. If 24 hour free cortisol level is high, then you will do another one. That is late night salivary cortisol. Salivary cortisol. If that's also high, you know, you can do another one. That is early morning cortisol. Early morning cortisol level. Okay. That's it. So in both of, in all of these conditions, if you see that cortisol level is high, what is the next thing that you should do? You have to measure which one? Is it huge? Very good. Okay, you have to measure ACTH. Now, two things can happen. Either ACTH could be low or ACTH could be high. If ACTH is low and cortisol is high, what does this indicate? This indicates that there is a adrenal tumor. Yes or no? Either there is an adrenal tumor or when we, okay, so let's talk about the adrenal tumor first, that there's an adrenal tumor. If there is an adrenal tumor, then you do what? A CT scan? Yes or no? If you see that the CT scan is positive, then you confirm your diagnosis for adrenal tumor. If it's negative, then what? Then the reason is exogenous. Okay, are we clear? Yes or no? <clears throat> okay. Now, let's talk about what would happen if ACTH is high and cortisol is high. If ACTH is high and cortisol is high, the next thing that we have to do is we have to do a high dose corticosteroid or dexamethasone suppression test. Now, when we give a high dose dexamethasone to a patient who has an ACTH secreting tumor, Will the high dose of dexamethasone suppress the tumor for a short period of time? Yes or no? Short suppress the secretion of ACTH for the short for a short period of time. This high dose of dexamethasone. The answer is yes. The high dose of dexamethasone will suppress the secretion of ACTH from the ACTH producing tumor for a short period of time. So when we do a high dose dexamethasone suppression test, there are two things that we can see. Number one. Either ACTH could be low after the high dose of dexamethasone that we will give to our patient, or the ACTH could be still high regardless. If the ACTH falls after you give a high dose of dexamethasone, what do we get? We get the diagnosis that this patient is suffering from a pituitary ACTH secreting tumor. So what do we do? We do an MRI of the pituitary. Okay, MRI. Why do we not do a CT scan of the pituitary and why do we do an MRI? CT scan is basically done to see uh, if there is any sort of compression, bleeding, or in anything else. MRI is more specific and MRI can detect soft tissues, changes more sp specifically. So that's why we'll do an MRI. Now, if ACTH is still high after giving high dose dexamethasone suppression test, then doesn't this mean that the ACTH is being secreted from somewhere else? other than the pituitary gland? The answer is yes or no? Yes. So this mean, this must mean that there either must be a problem in the lungs or any other lymphoma or anything else. So in that case, we have to do a CT 
of the chest to detect lung cancer, small cell lung cancer. Or we can do a CT of the abdomen or the pelvis to detect any sort of lymphoma that is there that is secreting ectopic ACTH. Okay. Next one is either we can do a high dose dexamethasone suppression test, or we can do another sort of test that we call CRH, where we try to see the stimulation from the hypothalamus. So either we do this or we do this. When we do this, if we stimulate the, um, for example, let's say ACTH is high, and even, at, and even with the high amount of um, ACTH, right? we give CRH, we give extra CRH to the, to the patient. This extra CRH that, that, will be, that will be given will stimulate the hypothalamus or the pituitary. Fast answers, please. They will stimulate the hypothalamus or the pituitary, the CRH. Which one? Pituitary, very good. Because the hypothalamus will secrete the, the CRH. So instead of the hypothalamus, stimulating the pituitary, we will give CRH that will stimulate the pituitary from outside. So if, it's a, if we suspect that there's a pituitary tumor and we give CRH from outside, can there be further increase of ACTH from a pituitary tumor? Yes. Or if there is an ectopic secretion of ACTH, will there be an increased secretion of ACTH under the influence of CRH, yes or no? The answer is no, because CRH does not stimulate the lungs or any other lymphoma. So in a CRH stimulation test, if the ACTH level increases after we give CRH, the diagnosis is pituitary tumor. In a CRH stimulation test, if the ACTH does not increase, then the diagnosis is small cell lung cancer or lymphoma. Okay, are we clear, yes or no? Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, do you guys wanna take two minutes to read this one, to read this portion? Yes, okay. So please take two minutes to read this portion. And then after that, uh, can I ask the name of three physicians who can help me out and help me finish this uh, ACTH test? Okay, who's confident that after reading for two to three minutes, they can, they can say, they can basically help me finish this or say this out loud after they read this for two minutes. Please write me in the chat box. If you want to participate in active participation, okay, Dr. Megula, who else is here? Who else can help me out? Who else can help me out? Okay, no one else? There's nothing to be worried about. There is nothing to be afraid about. If you make mistakes, that's very good. You'll learn from the mistakes. So please try to um, participate in active participation. The reason being is because not only will you be able to converse, but it will also allow you to speak with other physicians and try to, you know, it, it will allow your social communication skills to also increase. That's number one. Number two, if you make mistakes, then you will try, then you will learn from the mistakes much more easily. So that's that. So, okay. Let's take three minutes to read this table. And then after that, please, participate in active participation. It's 12, it's 1247 as of right now. Let's read this till 1250. Okay, thank you so much.
Okay, if you guys are done, then uh, please help me finish this up. Who else is done? Okay, so Dr. Tathim is done. Who else? Okay. Very good, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, so who wants to help me out first? Please write me in the chat box. Oh, so Dr. Mirgula, thank you so much. Let's begin. Okay, are you, are you going to unmute yourself or are you going to use the chat box for phone? I can now unmute and check. Oh, so you have a patient who comes to you with hypertension, hyperglycemia, obesity, stria, buffalo hump, moon face, menstrual irregularities. What is your provisional diagnosis? Uh, Cushing syndrome. Okay, so, so now what are you going to do? 24 hour uh, urinary free cortisol and uh, uh, late uh, salivary cortisol, if both of them are increased. Uh, then uh, we perform a low dose uh, dexamethasone overnight uh, test, and then we measure okay. the levels of uh, ACTH. Okay. Uh, then you ACTH, measure the level of the screen, one second. Level of ACTH. If, if all of these levels are high, then you measure ACTH. Yeah, if then. the ACTH is uh, suppressed. Uh, then uh, we consider it as uh, uh, ACTH uh, independent uh, okay. Cushing syndrome me, that is like just, ectopic. Wait, okay. just, give me, just give me one second. First of all, you measure ACTH. Now there are two things that can happen. Either it could be suppressed, suppressed or, or, or elevated. elevated. It, it remains elevated. elevated. Yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about what will happen if it's suppressed. No, uh, if it is suppressed, it, it is considered as uh, ACTH independent uh, Cushing syndrome. And okay. uh, we are so going, going to, to perform a CT for, uh, to confirm adrenal tumor, or it might be due to exogenous uh, corticosteroids. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Okay, so Dr. Mirula, thank you so much for helping us out. Let's now let's ask someone else. Who else can help me out with the uh, high ACTH level? Okay, so Dr. Reed, are you going to use the chat box or unmute yourself? Which one? Okay, help us out. So high ACTH, what would happen? Next thing, what do we do? High ACTH, now what do we do? Anyone? Okay. Are you there? Okay. High dose dexamethasone or, or CRH. Let's talk about high dose de dexamethasone. If we give high dose dexamethasone, what will happen? If it is suppressed ACTH or increased ACTH. If it's suppressed ACTH, there is no suppression is ectopic. Okay, so what do we do? We do a CT scan of lungs or abdominal or pelvis to diagnose lymphoma. If it's a high dose dexamethasone suppression test and ACTH is not suppressed. Wait, one second, we mix this up. Okay, after high dose of dexamethasone suppression test, if ACTH still remains high, then that must mean that the patient has a lung problem. If it's not high and ACTH is not suppressed, okay? So we will get, uh, wait one second. If we do a high dose dexamethasone suppression test and ACTH is high, then we do a CT scan. If it's suppressed, then we do an MRI of the PDK. Thank you so much. Okay, yes, that's what I was trying to understand. Okay. Let's talk about CRH. Who can talk about CRH? We can talk about CRH. Okay, Dr. Nazareth, thank you so much. What, how would you help us with the CRH stimulation test? Do you want to unmute yourself or use the chat box? Whichever. I will unmute. Okay, thank Hello. you. So CRH, what, what happens with the CRH? Okay. Either. So if, if we use a CRH stimulation test, if it stimulates the pituitary, we will have increase of ACTH and cortisol. 
So that will indicate that the Cushing did. So we do MRI of the pituitary. Okay. And after um, CRH, if ACTH is not suppressed? If it's not suppressed, or... it means in, mm -hmm. we have an, an ectopic source. So we will do a CT scan of the chest or the abdomen. Very good. Thank you so much. CT scan of, once again, the lungs for small cell carcinoma, ab abdomen or pelvis for lymphomas. lymphoma. Okay, thank you so much. So that's that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mithula, Dr. V, and Dr. Mithula for helping us out with this one. So with that being said, we're done with this. Let's talk about the text very quickly. These are the sources of pushing syndrome, etiologies, either it's exogenous, either it's primary, either it's um, basically a secreting tumor findings. I talked about this. Cholesterol will be high. Three cortisol in the urine will be high. Thinning, there will be thinning and stria, as you can see over here. This is a stria. Hypertension will be there. Why? Because cortisol. Can anyone tell me why do we get hypertension with the Cushing syndrome? Very high yield question for step one. Why do we get hypertension in Cushing syndrome? Anyone? I talked about this in physiology. Anyone? Why do we get vasoconstriction, alpha-1? What happens to alpha-1? Due to cortisol. What, what sort of action is this? Is this a permissive action? Yes or no? Permissive action, yes. Maybe. Even if suppression will be there, neoplasm will be there, growth restriction will be there, hyperglycemia will be there. Okay, so that's that. Screening tests, we will see increased free cortisol and late night celebrate for cortisol, so that's that. And then we will talk about the ACTH test, and that's that. Okay. Keep in mind, this is exceptionally high yield for step one, step two, C. Okay, now let's move on to Nelson syndrome. Okay, Nelson syndrome, let's move on to Nelson syndrome. What is Nelson syndrome? Okay, uh, let's start with Nelson syndrome from tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow we will finish pathology. Okay, we will finish. But we will finish pathology and um, that's it. Cortisol leads to high BP. Can you repeat please? Yes, cortisol increases the alpha-1 receptors in the blood vessels, which allows epinephrine and norepinephrine and all the other sympathetic neurotransmitters to permit their action and work more, okay? So are we clear about all the things we studied for today? Yes or no, up to Nelson syndrome. So we will start with Nelson syndrome tomorrow. Tomorrow, there is a possibility we will finish endocrinology because pharma, endocrine pharma is, is very small and there's not really much to understand from, from over here. So it will be really easy, except the diabetic drugs, anti-diabetic drugs, okay? Anti-diabetic drugs is something which is exceptionally high yield. Let's we'll talk about this tomorrow. Just give me one second while I make some plans. Uh, tomorrow, we will start with Nelson syndrome. Okay, adrenal insufficiency is very easy. It won't take that much time. Hyperaldosterone is easy. The endocrine has no problem. Multiple endocrine neoplasia is here. Okay. Then some tumors. Okay. So tomorrow we will finish endocrinology. Very high, very high possibility. Okay. Now, are we ready to start the AMBOS questions? What's the next system and when will we start payments? I'll talk about this after the end of the class. For now, let's start talking about Ambo. Okay, one second. Now, before I begin uh, talking about AMBOS and start doing questions from AMBOS, how many of you guys are doing UWorld questions already? Please say yes on the chat box or no in the chat box. How many of you guys are doing online UWorld questions? Okay, how many of you guys are doing offline UWorld questions?
on like, okay, who has their exam in the next six months? <clears throat> Okay, one, two, three. Okay, good. Next six months, you have your exam. You guys should be doing online U World already. Okay, online U World. You guys should be doing this already. So please start doing online U World. How many should you be doing? Um, how many? At least two blocks every day. Two blocks of 40 to 80 questions every day. If, it's, if, it, if your exam is in the next six months, then at least you should be doing 40 to 80 questions every day, at least. Okay. So that's that. If your exam is not in the next six months or eight months, then that's okay. You guys can follow a slower pace. That's pretty much that's not a problem. So let's start with the emboss questions in the time. Let's choose disciplines for today. Discipline wise, we will choose. Let's see. Discipline we will choose anatomy, biochemistry. In anthropology, in biology, epidemiology, we will choose. Just give me a second. I want to choose any pharma since we have not studied pharma yet. Okay, is everyone ready? Yes or no? Please write yes in the chat box if you're ready. If not, then I'll wait. Okay. Does everyone have their pen pencil on the side? To write the answers? Okay. Uh, I'll give you guys, let me prep you guys accordingly. Give me one second. So what does this mean? This means that we have exactly one minute and 30 seconds for each question, okay? Once the timer stops, then I'll move on to the next question, okay? So this, this is a short mimic of the actual exam. Now, do you guys want me to read along the question with you or do you guys want to solve the question by yourself? Last answer, please. Eventually later, I'll, I'll read the question. But if I read the question with you, some of you guys might get confused. So it's up to you. Can I get some fast feedbacks in the chat box? Try solving ourselves. Okay, so everyone wants to solve themselves. Very good. All alone. No, I will uh, mute myself and I'll keep on changing the questions after each 90 seconds. Okay. So your time starts now.
Okay, so the time is up. Is everyone ready? Yes or no for the answers? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay, which of the following is the most underlying cause of this patient's symptoms? 75 year old woman brought to the physician by her daughter because of one month history of fatigue, weight loss. Patient has a history of hypertension, has Alzheimer's. Okay, she does not remember the names of her medication, but she takes them every day. Okay, let's see what the answer is. Very good. Everyone who answered B, it's exogenous um, levothyroxine. It's not Graves' disease. Why? Because thyroid stimulating level is undetectable. In Graves' disease, TSH will be a little bit on the higher, on the higher side in initially. Later, it'll fall. So as you can see over here, there's also a little bit of follicular atrophy, which is which suggests that the TSH stimulation is low. So that's that. The answer is B over here. Exogenous levothyroxine. Daughter has hypothyroidism. Let's move on to the next question. 19 year old woman comes to the physician for a follow up examination. She has a history of type 1 diabetes. After reading the blood sugar level, the physician changes the anti diabetic regimen by changing the dose of an insulin that does not produce an, a peak. The dose of which of the following types of insulin was most likely changed? Okay, very good. The answer is glargine because it does not peak. Why? Because glargine is a long acting insulin, right? It's a long acting insulin. As you can see over here, insulin glargine is a long acting insulin. So it will never peak like this. So good job, everyone who chose A. Good job. Okay, let's move on to the next one. 75 year old man with a seizure disorder is brought to the ER because of progressive confusion. Cannot provide history. Vitals are normal. Oral mucosa is moist. There's no venous dis distension. Serum concentration of sodium is this. Osmolarity is low and ADH level is elevated. X ray shows. So show no, no abnormality. What is the most common cause? Seizure disorder. A patient must be taking what? Carbamazepine, yes or no? The answer should be medication. Yes. SIADH due to medication. See, carbamazepine. Did I talk about this yesterday? You guys remember this? Patient comes to you with a seizure problem, right? As a medication problem, you will you believe you have an Okay, next one. Patient's condition is most likely associated with increased stimulation of which type of cell? A uh, 21-year-old female comes with loss of hair on the frontal scalp. Okay. Uh, so if females lose hair, that must mean that they have excessive testosterone action. She is 17 uh, at the age of men menarche is 17. She has no history of serious illness. Uh, pulse BP is normal. Physical examination shows scattered postules and patches of velvety hyperpigmentation, which shows that this means the patient has insulin resistance, acanthosis negligence. Her morning serum uh, cortisol concentration is 18. The patient's condition is associated with which one? Which one do you guys think the answer is? Patch answer, please. Okay, very good. This is PCOS. This is not Cushing syndrome. Okay, this is PCOS. Why? Because over here, hair loss. You do not get hair loss in Cushing syndrome. In Cushing syndrome, uh, you do not have excessive testosterone. So, but in PCOS, there is there is uh, that excessive testosterone that plays in women that is responsible for scattered pustules, which means acne. Acne is developed in in PCOS and not Cushing syndrome. This is a very good question, which is something I want to talk about very quickly. Over here, just give me one second. Okay, what is the difference between Cushing syndrome and PCOS? <clears throat> okay, Cushing syndrome and PCOS. Cushing syndrome, over here, patients will have hair intact. Over here, no hair. Okay, or no hair or hair loss. Okay, patients will have. Hair loss, no hair is not the right thing to say, so hair loss. Over here, no acne, patients will have acne, okay? Then what else? Over here, patients will uh, have uh, your, which one? That is, over here, patients will have uh, hypertension, hyperglycemia. You will not get hypertension, no hypertension in PCOS, no hyperglycemia in PCOS, okay? Then over here, obesity will be there in both cases. Both of these patients will be obese, that's the thing. But strias are more common over here in Cushing syndrome, over here in PCOS, there's no stria. In Cushing syndrome, there is no acanthosis negligence. Acanthosis negligence are velvety hyperpigmentation, which shows insulin resistance in PCOS. Due to metabolic syndrome, you will get acanthosis negligence. That's simple. Then what else? You have some other things such as moon phase, buffalo hump, and everything else that will be here and not here. Okay, so very simply, that's what I wanted to say. Let's move on to the next one. 
Okay. 58 year old woman is brought to the ER 30 minutes after developing confusion, headache, vomiting. Physical examination shows left sided numbness. City scan shows a large hemorrhage, interparenchymal hemorrhage. Despite treatment, the patient dies, shows small aneurysm of the lenticular stride branches and bilateral hyperplasia. The patient's adrenal condition was most likely associated with which of the following symptoms? Okay. Which one? This is the following answer. Let's see some answers in the chat box. Okay, let's see. The answer is very good. Muscle weakness. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Ether. Thank you so much for choosing muscle weakness because this is a case of what? Can anyone? And can anyone tell me what this is a case of? Multiple small aneurysm of the lenticular stride and bilateral adrenal hyperplasia limited to the zona glomerulosa. So what does this mean? Anyone? This is Horn syndrome, right? Yes, this is Horn syndrome. If you have bilateral adrenal hyperplasia limited to, to zona glomerulosa, which hormone is being secreted excessively? Fast answer, please. Which hormone is being secreted excessively? Aldosterone? cortisol or androgen? The answer is aldosterone. Aldosterone will increase your blood volume. Yes or no? Fast answers, please. If it increases your blood volume, isn't there a possibility your blood pressure will also increase? Which is obviously it will increase. Yes or no? If it does increase in a patient, can it cause stroke? High blood pressure, can it cause stroke in the patients? Yes or no? The answer is yes. So, if you have a patient with aldosterone, hyperaldosterone, then what will happen to the potassium level? Will it fall or not? Or will it remain high? It will fall. If it falls, should we have muscle cramp and muscle weakness in all of these conditions? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Okay, this was a very difficult question. So if you guys got it right, then congratulations. As you can see, there are four hammers for this question. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Two days after undergoing an emergency laboratory, uh, following a motor vehicle, 37 year old man has thirst. So there is, uh, okay, so I think I talked about this. Dry membrane, decreased skin tiger, a review of the chest shows you and output to be in excess. Okay, I think I know what this thing is. The patient's condition was most likely damaged by which of the following structures? Let me see some answers in the, okay, let me see. Very good. Okay, posterior pituitary. I think I talked about this trauma to the posterior pituitary. Did I, did I not talk about the fact that you can get loss of ADH after getting a uh, headache or a uh, head trauma? Okay, yes. Okay, very good. Let's move on. A 36 year old woman comes to the physician for evaluation of unintentional weight gain and irregular menses. No medication, blood pressure is normal. Physical examination shows look, central obesity, hyperpigmentation, violaceous scar. Okay. Now, we talked about this today. This is an excellent question to solve today. Uh, let me see some answers in the chat box, please. Let me see what you guys chose. Some answers in the chat box. D. Okay. Let's see what the answer is. Very good. Very good, okay, D is, a, D is the answer. The patient has Cushing's disease, why? Because as you can see, there's hyperpigmentation. Hyperpigmentation means that the pituitary gland is secreting the ACTH. So will the pituitary secrete only ACTH or beta endorphin, ACTH and MSH? Which one? By, by only ACTH or very good, then, okay? So that's that. Did everyone understand this question? This is a very important question. Yes or no? Okay, let's move forward. Okay, blood pressure, potassium, and cortisol. Which of the following sets will we find? Newborn, uh, 6.2, okay, normal. Pregnancy and delivery were uncomplicated, 10 weeks of gestation, which showed the low risk of fetal aneuploidy at XY. Oh, okay. so patient is XY. If the patient is XY, what does this mean? Uh, male or a female? Fast answers, please. XY, what does this mean, male or a female? Thank you so much. It means a male. So examination shows female external genitalia. So serum study shows a decreased level of 17 hydroxypregnenolone. What does this mean? That means there is an absence of 17 alpha hydroxylase. Yes or no? If there's absence of 17 alpha hydroxylase, which one of this is the correct answer? Obviously, there should be high amount of mineral corticoid activities and glucocortical activities. Let's see what the answer is. Give me some answers in the chat box, please. Which one did you guys choose? Let's see. Which one did you guys choose? Okay. D, D and Cs. Okay, let's see what the answer is. I think the answer is C. Very good. Okay, because over here, blood pressure is going to be high. Potassium is going to be high. Uh, this is the difference. Cortisol is going to be low, not increased. I'm going to tell you why. Okay. Because 17-alpha hydroxyl deficiency will uh, 
your in, it, it, it results in decreased synthesis of both the sex hormones and uh, the glucocorticoids. So what happens is um, over here, the reason why is because, for example, um, you have hypocortisolism, hypo which leads to an increase in the secretion of ACTH from the pituitary gland. And stimulation of the adrenal cortex results in increased production of mineralocorticoids, while hyperaldosterone causes hypertension and the deficiency is with patients with excess genotyper. So look, what happens over here is basically the cortisol level in, in this patient, it will be uh, not increased, it will be decreased. The reason being is because when the patient doesn't have 17 alpha hydroxylase. Um, uh, so what happens is over here, the adrenal androgens, they are decreased. I, I mean, they are, they are decreased as a result. This male, um, this male fetus, this male baby looks like a female baby. And since that's the case, the reason is because over here, there is um, some amount of 17 alpha, which is needed to convert this one to this one, okay? Let me show you where the issue is. Reduce this. Okay, let me show you why the cortisol level is decreased. Look. So this is zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis. Over here, what's happening? Cholesterol, two, pregnenolone, two, progesterone, two. Which one? Can anyone help me out with this? This is? Which one? Can anyone help me out? Okay, thank you. Corticosterone and then aldosterone, right? Okay. In order for pregnenolone to move this way, which enzyme does it need? 17, right? So if 17 is not there, then can we get um, 11 BC to cortisol? Do we get cortisol? Because the movement in this way is not happening. As a result, the cortisol level, it falls. So we need 17 alpha hydroxylase for the synthesis of cortisol and androgen. As a result, aldosterone will be high, cortisol will be low, and adrenal androgens will be low. Okay, are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. Let's move forward. Six-month boy is brought to the ER by his mother because of recurrent vomiting and yellowing of his eyes. The mother says that he has been eating poorly since he started weaning off breast milk five days ago. Oh, you guys might not be able to answer this. Okay, I'm not sure if some of you can. So this patient has vomiting and yellowing of his eyes. Okay, so this is, okay, so look what's happening over here. At this time, mashed vegetables and fruits were added. Examination shows jaundice. Okay, right after fruits were added, examination shows jaundice and the tip of the liver is palpated. Which of the following enzyme is most likely deficient? Okay, so this is a case of what? Can anyone tell me what this is a case of? This is a case of? Can anyone tell me what this, what the diagnosis is? Is this fructosuria, gallic, hereditary fructose intolerance? Very good. Hereditary fructose intolerance. Because I'm not sure if you guys remember this, because there is there's a mnemonic called fab gut. You know what fab gut is? <clears throat> fab gut is fructose is broken down by aldolase B. Galactose is broken down by UDP, gal UDP galactokinase, right? If we have essential uh, fructosuria, then that's benign. Hereditary fructose intolerance is the, characterized by the inability to take fruits. Why? Because you do not have the enzyme to break down fructose. As a result, this, this excessive fructose will cause hepatic damage. So that's that. We'll talk about this in details in genetics. All the other students who could answer this, thank you so much. So that's that. Okay, next one, a 44 year old woman comes to the physician because of a six month history of fatigue, constipation and seven kilogram weight gain. Menses are irregular, false is this, examination shows pallor, treatment with appropriate therapy is initiated. After several weeks of therapy with this drug, which of the following hormone is expected? Okay. Can anyone help me out with this? 
What is the correct answer? Please give me some answers in the chat box. A, Z, A, and E. Some students chose A, another chose A, another chose B. Okay. Good. The answer is increase RT3. Okay. So basically, this is a case of hypothyroidism. In hypothyroidism, what do we give? We give levothyroxine, right? So levothyroxine will increase your RT3 formation, right? By how? By um, over here, levothyroxine is a synthetic form of T4, which is converted to RT3. So the thing is, levothyroxine is T4, and when we break down T4, we get T3 and RT3. So over here, decreased T3 is not the correct answer because uh, there should be increased T3. And with T3, we also have RT3. RT3 will also increase. Since an increase of reactants leads to an increase in the product, RT3 would be expected to increase after several weeks of levothyroxine use. So what does this indicate? This indicates that a patient who has been taking levothyroxine for a long period of time will have a high amount of T4. This high amount of T4 will be converted to T3 and RT3, reverse T3. Okay, this is by which one? Diogenes. Okay, that's why the correct answer is RT3. This was a tricky question. Now, how many of you guys have, have scored five out of 10? Five out of 10. Very good, thank you so much, Dr. Ellen, Dr. Sanjeeva, uh, Dr. Mithila, Dr. VK, Dr. Talia. Okay, so if you scored five out of 10, so very good. Okay, is there anyone with a better score? Above five, nine. Nine out of 10, okay, so even I did score nine out of 10. Okay, so this is very, very good. Okay, congratulations and thank you so much. Okay, very good score. Keep up the good work, really proud of you guys over here. Dr. Ellen is eight, very good. Okay, all the other students who scored below five, nothing to be worried about, absolutely nothing to be worried about. What does this mean? This means that you have understood first aid, but you need to solve more questions, yes? So do more euro. Okay. Every day we will be solving questions and assessing our performance. So don't worry about this. Okay. Now, do you have a, do you have a, do you have a question regarding the fact that what would happen to your endocrine knowledge when we study, let's say CVS? Isn't there a possibility you'll forget endocrine? Yes or no? When we study CVS, for example, or what would happen to endocrine and CVS when we study GIT? GIT? Right. So. What, what we will do to prevent this, what we will do to prevent this is every day when we are solving questions, this is what we will do. We will choose step one and in the system wise, for example, let's say we're done with endocrine system, today we're solving CVS, but when we're doing questions, we will still be doing endocrine and CVS together. Then let's say we finish GI tract. So we will choose endo, CVS, and GI tract. Then let's say we finish reproductive. We will choose endo, GI, CVS. So the thing is we will keep on getting questions from all different types of, um, all, all the different types of topics, which will make sure that we do not forget our knowledge. Okay. Is that a good way to remember all the information? Yes or no, keep on practicing. Okay, good. The reason why I told you this is because I need you guys to do the exact same thing with you world. That's the reason why I'm sharing this with you. I need you guys to do the exact same thing in you world. Okay. A couple of information over here very quickly. Uh, the class for tomorrow will start at 9.30 a.m. Okay. There is a slight possibility that, that the class might be a little bit delayed. I'm still not sure about this, but uh, it will still start at 9.30 as of right now. If there are any changes, I'll mention it on my page and I'll mention it in the emails. Another thing, uh, the links for the class will be received. Can anyone tell me where do we get the links for the class? Fast answers, please. Where do we get the links for the class? Anyone? Email or, or Facebook. Very good. Facebook, the, the Facebook page. I'll be uploading the links on the Facebook page, especially since the classes are still free. I'll be uploading the links on the Facebook. So if you guys have friends who wants to come and join the class, they have not received the email, please. Um, they're more than welcome to come and join our class since it's so free. So please do not hesitate to share this as much as you want. Um, and tomorrow we will be talking about 
payments. Yeah. Tomorrow we will be talking about payments. I requested to join the step one discussion group. Yes. So the thing is step one discussion group, this one, this discussion group is only for students who are subscribed members. So once we are done with the subscriptions and payments and everything else, then students who are waiting to join the group will easily join the group. Okay. So that's the reason why they are not being accepted as of right now. Okay. So that's that. Tomorrow's free too. Yes, tomorrow's free too. And as a matter of fact, this whole week is still free. Uh, okay. So uh, over the course of this, uh, over the course of this um, weekend, uh, we will try to make sure that the students start with the subscription from next week, Monday. So please uh, prepare accordingly. We'll tell you exactly how to, what are the options for completing your transactions. Uh, if you guys are worried about the transactions, we will tell you exactly how, how much we charge. Um, before I show you how much we charge, let me see how much anyone, any other USMLE teacher, USMLE tutor, uh, step one let's see how let's see how much they charge then i can tell you how much we charge versity us assembly tutoring one-on-one -on -one assembly tutoring US assembly tutors from 24 dollars an hour daily tutors one-on-one -on -one tutors let's see how much they charge okay. the reason why i'm showing this to you guys is because i just want to see here <laughs> Basically, what I'm trying to say is, I'm not sure why they're not showing you now. The charge is here. It's the mission. Okay, so basically what I'm trying to tell you guys is I'm having a little bit of difficulty trying to come up with the pricing of, oh, there you go. There's a little bit of pricing as you can see over here, which is um, <clears throat> med school tutors. Uh, they start at $249 per hour with package discounts up to 10% and everything. Else. Okay, so the reason what I'm, the thing which I'm trying to tell you guys over here is that USMLE step one tutoring is exceptionally, exceptionally expensive. So, to keep it simple for everyone, we will be charging for step one, we will be charging instead of anything above $100 or $249 per hour, we will be charging exactly $1 per hour. Okay, so that's exactly what I've been doing for the last one year or more than that. And I'll still be doing the same thing. Uh, yeah, I actually wanted to increase the price, but then again, I, don't know, I personally think I will not do that. So this comes to around a hundred dollars per month, more or less. I think it should be nothing compared to the other tutors. So that's that. And with this, you're you're getting all the help from first aid. You're getting emboss, physio, and all the other lectures and subscriptions. So this is uh, very very cheap compared to everything else. So the reason why is um, the reason why I'm talking about this and comparing myself with the other tutors. <clears throat> Obviously, they might be a little bit better and everything else, but uh, I highly doubt any one of us can actually afford a an expensive tutor as such and they will not read with you they, they will not read the first aid with you step by step word by word which we do uh they will not share any other resources or question banks which we will they will not share any other big monics which we will for example physio and all of those things so that's that so I, I would personally think that this is a very good investment so it's something to think about the reason why i'm sharing this one more time is because you guys are worried about the payments so that's what the payment is Tomorrow, I'll tell you the options. What are the options and ways and the ways you can complete your payment for a month and hopefully subscribe. Uh, another thing over here is um, another thing that I want to say is the maximum occupancy of this class is 25. Because okay, so I will not take more than 25 students. And as of right now, we already have 15 uh, spots 
which are which are filled up. Uh, students have already been um, a lot of you guys over here in between. I mean, some of you guys have already uh, completed your payments <clears throat> and you guys have already filled up your spots. So we already have a handful of spots left, uh, more or less 10 spots left. So tomorrow when we talk about the payment, it's more or less going to be on a first come first serve basis. If it exceeds 25, the 26th student will not be allowed to make any payments. Unfortunately, I apologize. The reason being is because I do not want to take more students because I do not want to focus on too many people over here because the focus has to be limited so that everyone gets uh, undivided att attentions. So that's that. So that's basically what it is. Does anyone else have any other questions regarding payments? How can we subscribe in the meantime? In the meantime, just keep on doing the free lectures, which you will get in your email and on the Facebook page, okay? So you guys will be receiving the email and on, and on your Facebook page and on my Facebook page. So that's how you can subscribe. From tomorrow, we'll talk about the payments. And from next week, Monday, we will only take subscribe lectures. There are a couple of things in which we will add to the subscribe lectures, which we are not adding since the, these lectures are a little bit free. What you will get with the added subscriptions of the lectures is you will get step two CK clinical informations. And the reason why we will give you guys step two CK notes for step one is because step one is becoming pass fail from next year. Okay. And uh, the reason why it's becoming passing pass fail, they will incorporate more clinical information for another reason is because step two CS is canceled for the current COVID pandemic. So they're incorporating more clinical questions in step one to sort of uh, make up for the lost exams. So that's why we will be sharing more uh, step two CK notes in step one, which we will start from next week for only the subscribed students. So that's that. And also the amount of questions which we will be doing from MBOSS will go up from 10 to at least 20 questions every day. So that's another reason to start, uh, wait for the subscription to start. So that's that, okay. Any other questions? Which system will you start? I will start a very important system next week for only the subscribed students. That is CVS, one of the most highest yield system for step one. So that's that. Okay, any other question? Yeah. Uh, another thing over here, the lecture recording from yesterday, it is uploaded in the YouTube channel for absolutely free, obviously, right? So this is the lecture from yesterday. Okay, let me just share the link with you guys over here. If you guys have not received the lecture recording, then this is where it is. If you guys have uh, difficulty, then please go to my YouTube channel and over there you'll find it. Do, do, if we subscribe, do we get a recording? Yes, every day, every student who will subscribe to our lecture, regardless if they join, if they are present in the batch or not, they will receive a recording, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm a first batch student. How can you receive the lecture link from next week? Students of the first batch, the reason why um, we will not be able to uh, give you guys the lecture if you do not subscribe, the reason being is because this time we are keeping the occupancy to very, very minimum. So it's a minimum occupancy of 25 students. So if you want to receive the lectures and uh, if you want to continue the classes, then we are afraid you might have to subscribe again. Uh, and the reason being is because since the first time we only did U World offline and first aid. And that's why we told our students that when we take classes again, we you will not be charging anymore. But since we are subscribing to new stuffs, we're, we're subscribing to Emboss, Physio, and Step 2 CK uh, notes from U World, since we will unfortunately not be able to allow uh, students without their proper subscription from next week. So that's that. So uh, please contact us for any other information. We'll, we'll see how we can help you guys out further. Next question, Dr. Hyderi, do you think I'm kind of taking step two CK class will help with step one or should I use the time to focus on step one? Please only focus on step one if step one is your next exam. You do not have to focus on step two CK. Step two CK, I will tell you exactly what you need if you subscribe to our channel. I mean, to our YouTube, uh, to our tutoring platform, I'll tell you exactly what you need from step two CK. Okay, but if your next exam is step one, then please only focus on step one. Okay, any other questions? Yes or no? Any other question? No, so no other question. 
So thank you so much. Hope you guys have a great day. Please keep your eyes on your email and on our page for the link for tomorrow. If you guys have any further questions, please send us an email and we'll get back to you. And with that, we wish you a very happy day. Hope you guys stay well. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.